Recording in progress. Okay. Oh, I'm going to mute that. Okay, great. Whew. All right. We're ready to go. Okay, so I am going to uh, call the meeting to order. And so the, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. And we have some changes to make. So <clears throat> the first thing uh, is that we're going to jettison uh, a few items here. Um, one is we are going to um, uh, jettison number... Oh, where did it? Okay, um, or, uh, we're going to jettison the the lockers, um, as well as the uh, reaffirming the strategic plan. Uh, so, otherwise, we will take it as it is listed. Um, anyone else have thoughts on the agenda? I'm sorry of your terminology. You mean delete? Oh, yes. Okay. We're not going to be doing those. Okay. <laughs> right. Delete. <laughs> yes. Um, Till another, another time. Yes. I thought at first she meant move ahead, like jettison. Anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just being, you know, too fancy. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we'll take those up another time. Uh, okay. Um, any other thoughts on the agenda? Okay. Uh, all right. So um, with that, we will consider the agenda approved. So on to general business and appearances. Uh, this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on our agenda. Otherwise, uh, if you have a comment that is pertinent to an agenda item, then there will be an opportunity to uh, speak to that item as it comes up in the agenda. Uh, but uh, if it is not on our agenda, now is the time. If you would say your name, uh, where you live, and try to keep your comments to about two minutes, uh, that is very helpful uh, to us. And um, just so everybody knows, um, the, the consent agenda, uh, though the consent agenda, just the way that it works, in case anybody is unfamiliar, is that is a... Um, uh, items that are assumed to be non-controversial, you can still comment on them if you would like, just let us know and, uh, you know, raise your hand uh, or whatnot, and we will um, take comments on those. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> to kick us off, um, I actually have a, a thing that I would like to uh, start us off with. Uh, since I'm the mayor and I, I get to, I can call on myself first, um, so just this past March 13th, an anniversary came and went that uh, uh, should have been recognized uh, two years ago, um, which was, that was the hiring date of Bill Frazier, our city manager. And um, I wish I could blame COVID as the reason that we did not recognize that that was his 25 years of working uh, for the city of Montpelier. Um, but I, I cannot blame that. But to, so to, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is the first meeting since that date, um, and so I'm thinking of this as the second anniversary of your 25 years. <laughs> so we have a pin for you. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> thank you very much. It's like those last two years just did <laughs> that. That's right. <laughs> We're back in person. <laughs> exactly. No problem. It's been an honor serving you. Yes. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, all right. So, beyond that, um, I will turn it over to the public. Um, if you have something, you can um, uh, just form a queue up here, and uh, we'll take people in person first, and then we'll go to people um, that are uh, online. Uh, Go ahead and go. So again, say your name, where you live, and if you can, try to keep your comments to about two minutes. I'll just take my mask off so I can speak more clearly. Uh, my name is uh, Hanif Nazarali. I'm here today as the program liaison for CAN, and that's Capital Area Neighborhoods. Um, so I'd like to give you a quick update um, on CAN, though um, today's a special day for CAN because on the consent agenda for this meeting is a formal partnership uh, between the city and program support at Sustainable Montpelier. 
But I'd like to speak a little bit on what CAN is for, for those who don't already know that. Sustainable Montpelier has been supporting CAN for several years and through the era of COVID. In essence, CAN is about connecting people and place. And CAN is a volunteer-led neighborhood network that has grown to have 30 coordinators in 20 neighborhoods across Montpelier. So the uh, Memorandum of Understanding and the Consent Agenda aims for some new work, um, and that is to recruit more CAN coordinators, connect more neighborhoods, uh, and establish a regular two-way communication uh, between the residents and the city. So Sustainable Montpelier will support the coordinators in the neighborhoods with timely information and tools for communication and organizing neighborhood events. So one new initiative is the neighborhood information kiosk. Um, we have a new prototype kiosk for neighborhoods that provides a sort of a physical place, a bulletin board for posting news and events. Another new piece of the program is civic engagement. Some of you might um, have participated in, been involved. CAN recently hosted a candidate forum for District 3 elections so that residents in District 3 could get to know the candidates. So we're planning that to follow up with other forums so that residents can bring their voice to the councillors through their CAN coordinators. So when I say we, um, I mean the team at Sustainable uh, Montpelier, including Laura Brook, who has worked hard to make CAMP program support what it is today. And I'm just stepping in to assist with that program. Hello, I'm Laura Brook. I just wanted to say hi, put a face to the name. I've met you all, but to anybody who's watching, um, I'm super excited Hanif is acting as CAN program liaison. I think it's going to be great. He has community organizing background, um, but we've learned a lot these last two years and partnering with you all, with the city staff, the CAN coordinators, like the boots on the ground. We're excited to make some progress and take a move on these things here. So thank you. Thank you. Shifting gears a little bit. Um, my name is Diane Sherman. I'm a resident of Montpelier and a property owner here. Um, and I have a general public comment. I anticipate many of you have read this article, Roaches and Broken Locks, that was published in seven days last November. Um, it, it's a joint, for anybody who doesn't know, it's a joint investigation by VPR in seven days that about a landowner with a history of long-standing history of non-compliance with housing codes. And it outlined the problems faced by municipalities trying to obtain compliance. So to help our community avoid getting into this exact same situation, I propose that Montpelier adopt an amendment to our zoning and subdivision regulations that would expressly authorize the DRB to deny or condition a development permit based on the compliance history of an applicant. I'm not saying that the DRB doesn't have this authority right now, but it's opaque at best. I have two brief points of clarification. One, writing such an amendment warrants care because as you may know, precedent exists that indicates an applicant's identity should not be considered when reviewing development applications. This obviously for good reason, it helps prevent um, discrimination. However, there is a distinct and significant difference between these two considerations. One is taking into account an applicant's identity, such as their race, their gender, or even their motivation behind putting forward a development permit, all of which is off limits. On the other hand, there's taking into account um, the applicant's past property use as demonstrated by their compliance history with the exact type of laws they will be expected to comply with in the context of the property use they are proposing. So consider the state of Vermont, agencies and departments within the state routinely consider and in fact are required to consider an applicant's compliance history with applicable and comparable laws when considering whether to issue permits and licenses. I'm asking Montpelier to do the same for the 
DRB to give it that authority. Um, second point, and I will keep this brief and provide written follow up. But as we know, I want to recognize that housing is a major concern, and I wouldn't want to ask you to adopt an amendment that was so broad that would deter responsible landowners from putting forth applications. So I would propose that you really focus this amendment on the problem, which includes, for instance, um, the situation of repeat and knowing disregard of housing code requirements dealing with tenant and community health, safety, and welfare and retaliatory actions taken against tenants when entities and individuals try to correct that noncompliance, among other things that are outlined in this article and again that I'll address in writing. But what this creates um, is what is outlined in this article is a situation that is completely intractable for the municipality and also for the communities in which these developments exist. So in short, I'm asking you to consider preventing this from happening here. I'm asking you to put on the agenda in a, in a meeting coming up and vote on a um, vote to task the Planning Commission to work with your attorney to draft an amendment to the zoning and subdivision regulations that would grant express authority to the DRB to deny or condition a permit based on the compliance history of an applicant from their property use that rises to this level. Um, thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susan C. Walbridge. I live at 11 Monsignor Crosby Avenue. I was born here. I've lived my entire almost 69 years here. I've lived 67 of my years in the same house. Um, but I want to share another story about what's going on with Ukraine. Um, I went to the State House vigil, the evening one, and so the day before I found out about that, I went to town on trying to make something. Um, and in that particular case, I didn't have the text on this, but I had uh, battery operated candles on each side since it was a vigil, so it would illuminate it. While I'm standing there, a couple comes to me and they asked to take a picture of it. Turns out is because they wanted to send pictures of it to Kiev right after the vigil, where they have family that are stuck and cannot escape. And I got, I exchanged, you know, information with them and I got a um, text the next morning from the wife and it had made it to Kiev. So they know that Vermont cares and they know this happened in Montpelier. Um, and then I joined the group at the post office Tuesdays and Thursdays for just the noon hour. And I was there and there's two women that are there and they're both Ukrainians that had moved to Vermont. And one of them at the very end came over and said, I want pictures of your sign. And again, it was to send them live again over to two different cities that again were being bombed so that her families couldn't get out. And at the um, meeting yesterday, she approached me to say that she got word back that they got those pictures. So people, it does make a difference. I mean, I'm shocked that this got over their lives so that they know. And one of them, the cousin had said how emotional he became to know so far away people care and they know the truth of what's going on. So be proud of that. And I'm proud to be a native Montpelierite. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Um, I attempted to ask a member of the council to ask for an agenda item. Uh, there's a pending open meeting vi violation. The city really needs an attorney to uh, address these issues. Uh, every public records and open meeting violation, every public records request and appeal to the head of the agency and open meeting violation are absolutely bungled by the city manager. He does not know the law. He's not obviously consulting, but the open meeting violation is explicit to a certain subset of meetings that were enacted, that were held virtual only re relating to the Act 78 of 2022. Those recordings are not in the city's possession and ORCA is not obligated to provide copies. Same is issue happens with CVPSA, but that's another story, another forum. Uh, so you're going to end up to comply with the law. You're going to need to have a special meeting either Thursday, Friday, or Monday, and then com complete the written response according to the statutory requirements before Monday, which is a, it's a 10 calendar day deadline, unlike public records law, which is 
uh, five business days from an appeal. Um, so I attempted to get it on the agenda so you could discuss it. You may want to add it under other business and discuss it. I don't want to use up my two minutes on that topic, but it, it's your obligation to deal with that. Um, redactions. I've made public records requests and anybody who's anybody can say, oh, that's co confidential. But when we're spending public money on public radios and public technology, the public has a right to know what it's being spent on, what model numbers, what prices, et cetera. You can't just, you know, carry water for some over secretive corporation. Um, there was a case, I had a case here in Superior Court and Judge Teachout made clear to the, it was vital, the functional equivalent of a public agency with regard to medical records, said government is not in the business of keeping trade secrets. So she gave a limited window of time to allow Motorola in this case to seek an injunction to prevent the release of the data. So what I would ask you to consider is these types of redactions. Uh, redactions for system security are one thing, though I'm not arguing with those. Redactions for trade secrets that aren't even our trade secrets, because we don't have trade secrets, uh, invoke the 10 day, 10 business day, and give the party who's claiming the trade secrets 10 days to get an injunction or that it's gonna get released. But you can't be buying hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars worth of radio equipment and, and et cetera, and keep the people from being able to scrutinize uh, what's being bought, how is, it, how is it compatible, et cetera. So that's a problem. Those, that, that's an appeal to the head of the agency that's long overdue and still hasn't been responded to properly. You need to give clear direction to your head of the agency on how to handle that. Um, Bathrooms. The bathrooms committee still has not met. I I, I swear y'all should just quit using the bathroom until you can make some bathrooms available. April 15th, we're about to have 10 more homeless people on the street, virtually doubling the population downtown of the unhoused. And we don't have 24 hour bathrooms and we're still not enforcing the bathrooms at the transit center during the lunch hour, which is again, a violation of the lease and uh, a mismanager not enforcing the lease. The ten, over $10,000 has been spent on an architect to consider public safety dispatch renovation designs, which is totally at odds, which has been going on in secret and at odds and undermining the work of Central Vermont Public Safety Agency. I have not yet got a clear reading from a lawyer on whether Montpelier may have a fiduciary obligation to not undermine the very intermunicipal corporation that it is a member of. And so to flagrantly be undermining it by having Chief Pete, you know, hire Black River Design with no approval by the council to spend over $10,000 doing work that might be all for naught. That's reckless expenditure of the public money. And it's beyond the authority in my view of the city manager to spend that kind of money. I also understand he's been spending money on uh, the Elks Club property, again, without an approved budget for such. Um, I would ask that the police corruption issues be put on the agenda. We need a citizen oversight body, not a review or an advisory. We've got police, I've got, I've got personal evidence of police theft, harassment, destruction of evidence and lying on sworn statements. That needs to be brought up and discussed. That's not something you put on the scope of your police review committee. It didn't get dealt with in the report and y'all keep trying to sweep it under the rug. Um, Agendas and packets, I think you should always have at least a couple of agendas and full packets so that uh, documents can be referenced that are included, that are coming up. Um, I will save the locker discussion. Parklet, you were told last meeting that, that none of the parklets were put in fire lanes. That was another lie by our city manager. The fire lane signs were even, one of the fire lane signs was cut down and bolted to the outside of the parklet. Uh, in the Haney lot, uh, eight feet further from where it, its original stem is. So it was beyond the city manager's authority to issue a parklet permit 
that wasn't in a parking place. A fire lane is not a parking place. He did not have the authority to, ins and to create that, and it's in a fire lane. I learned about it from the complaints from the truckers that have to come in and out of there delivering food. So, but you, you need to deal with the fact that you're not getting the truth uh, as often as you like to pretend you are. Thank you. Anyone else uh, who's in person? Okay. All right. So there are a few folks online who would like to say something, and uh, we're going to go in the order that you appear on, on my screen. So uh, we are going to start with uh, Joanne. Uh, so to be fair, um, before you go, Joanne, I just want to make a note for folks uh, who are online. If you could change your name uh, to be your first and last name, um, that would be helpful so I can address you properly and we can have your name uh, accurately for the record. Uh, but anyway, uh, Joanne, go ahead. Hi, Jody Pedersen from Colonial Drive. I don't know, the Zoom the Zoom uh, link wouldn't work for me, and I ended up having to put in all the numbers, and I ended up with something different, but I'll try to fix it for next time. No thank worries. you. Um, thank you, Mayor. I was wondering if uh, our city manager could give us a brief update on the status of the um, land purchase. Um, anything moving along with that, including may maybe a summary of how many um how much feedback mary smith has received by email i know we had up to 155 people at that first meeting um wondering when you might be planning another meeting and what what are the next steps i noticed i didn't see anything on the agenda about it that's why i'm asking and i also did not see any uh, are there going to be zoning changes started for that? I saw something about the rec field and the zoning changes, but were, were there any um, proposed change of uh, designation for that area? Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to answer um, some sure. of those? I was actually going to talk about this briefly at the end of the meeting, so I'll try to remember everything you asked, Jody. Um, I think the easiest thing is uh, we actually have on our next meeting's agenda was going to be to go through the follow up process. So we'll have more detail about that at that time. So April 13th, I believe, is the date. So our, our next regular council meeting, I think we received about 10 additional comments from Mary. We're compiling them now in, um, you know, by category so that we can put those back out. Uh, we're Assuming the council approves the consent, consent agenda tonight, we're getting a new piece of software that allows for sort of polling and public back and forth. So we're going to be putting those out for public comment uh, in between. Uh, as far as uh, the actual purchase, we are exchanging purchase and sale agreements, for finalizing some details. And I suspect that will finalize after April 1. Uh, as far as zoning, that's it's kind of way too early for that. We, you know, I think we need to see what gets master planned and what is needed and, and what the, what if any zoning changes are needed at that time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Jennifer um, Tochi, I'm not sure how to say your last name. Uh, Jennifer, are you there or looks like also Hi. Hi. Maybe this is Alan. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, Jennifer Tose and Alan Johnson. This is Alan Johnson speaking, Montpelier residents. Um, before moving up here a little over a year ago, I was on the Harvard Select Board for five years and chaired the Energy Commission down there for eight years before that. So just so you know where I'm coming from, I want to say thank you very much to everyone uh, on this call, particularly our um, representatives and our, our staff members that put in so much extra work for these calls. And I appreciate the challenges of... Uh, letting people speak and be heard and uh, giving them extra time to to be heard uh, and navigating those waters delicately. So thank you so much for that. And um, I mainly wanted to put in a uh, vote of support for the previous speaker. I apologize I didn't catch her name uh, regarding holding people accountable for their past records of uh, adherence to law, uh, certainly for development in areas of public safety like that. Uh, we certainly do the same thing in many other areas of government particularly uh, best example off the top of my head is the liquor licenses that are about to be approved, right? So if you don't hold up to the liquor laws, you have a bad track record, you don't get to participate in that area of public safety. So uh, it's definitely something to consider. I think it sounds like a, a, a good policy. 
uh, there may be pitfalls, but worth considering. And um, and then just to mention, I don't know, it seems like um, Mr. Frazier's microphone has improved a little bit, but uh, it's uh, definitely a poor sound quality on this end uh, coming from his mic. That is all, thanks. All right, thank you. All right, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Kelman. I live on Mountain View Street in Montpelier. I'm pretty sure that you, the mayor, city council, and city manager are all aware that as a result of intense public pressure, the landlords, Mark and Rick Bove, have now reversed their decision to evict 24 low-income, mostly refugee families from a Winooski apartment complex that the Boves own and had intended to renovate in order to charge market rate rents. Uh, I think that many, if not all of you, are concerned and perhaps frustrated that it isn't clear whether you as leaders of Montpelier city government would be able to prevent similarly unjustified evictions happening here. And that's why I think it's important that you take away from these events two vital lessons. One, Vermont and perhaps municipalities like Montpelier badly need enforceable, responsible landlord laws. And two, even if municipalities like Montpelier are currently unable to regulate and enforce responsible landlord behavior, the voices of you, our government leaders, joined with others, can create the kind of public, public pressure that caused the Boves to radically alter their plans. Uh, I've emailed all of you a copy of the letter that Winooski city leaders and a coalition of nonprofits sent to Governor Phil Scott and legislative leaders asking, among related matters, that state lawmakers enact new protections for low income and refugee tenants. I, I hope that you've all had or will have a chance to read it. And now, even though the situation in Winooski appears to have been resolved in a socially just manner, I speak on behalf of a number of Montpelier residents who have contacted me to urge you, our city council, to publicly endorse that letter at your earliest convenience. The city council is known for taking stands such as uh, uh, Sanctuary City, uh, having Black Lives Matter uh, uh, painted on our side, uh, on, our, on our streets, um, and, and uh, non-citizen voting. This is the same kind of issue that you can speak out on whether or not you have the legal right to, to, to regulate it. Although I, again, endorse Diane Sherman's request that you look into uh, the legality of it because it may turn out that you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just on that note, I did have the opportunity to check in with the mayor of Winooski, Mayor Lott, uh, about the letter that uh, they are sending uh, to their lawmakers, to their to their delegation there, and uh, asked if it would be appropriate for us to uh, sign on to it, and she thought that would be just fine. Um, even though I, I will note that the last paragraph of that letter says that, you know, we are supporting the particular uh, residents of this one building block and obviously the people signing on to that letter in from Anuski would be supporting them in a very different way than we are but um nonetheless it's uh, it sounds like that would be all right so um one possibility um is that we could uh, uh look at signing on to such a letter um uh, I, I would recommend for next time so that the uh, such a letter would have the opportunity to be um, circulated and published and the you know the community would have the opportunity to check that out before we uh, approve something like uh, tonight uh, unless unless you want to um, but uh, that, I guess that would be my recommendation is that we put that uh, on for next time um, I'm seeing some nods any other th thoughts on that yes Lauren I mean, just process wise, it looks like this was already submitted. Does it make sense for us to write a brief letter just supporting the sentiments of it and submitting it to the same entities if this is kind of a closed letter? That would be. Um, I mean, I, I like the idea, and thanks, Peter, for bringing this and for people um, raising some good ideas about how to um, put this out there. But just process wise, sure. We could think about that That's before fine. next meeting, I guess. Um, thoughts on that? Okay, <laughs> so we'll, we'll go in that direction. Okay, all right. So can we ask you to, to draft something up for us? Thank you. Awesome.
And you have the copy of the original. Okay, super. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Thank you uh, for your comments. Uh, all right, so we are going to move on now to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Yes, Jack. Move the consent agenda. Just to note, there are no minutes on the consent oh, agenda. Oh, thank you. I'll second it. Okay, and and we are, we're understanding that it's without the minutes. Okay. Right. There is an email from the clerk uh, earlier today, and we're expecting that on the agenda okay. next time. Okay. Um, any comments on the consent agenda or any items on, on it? Yes, Lauren. Uh, just briefly, just wanted to say that I'm really appreciating the analysis that we're getting about vehicles and purchases that involve fossil fuels and the uh, responsibility I know all of our departments are taking as we all try to get to net zero and the, the challenges we sometimes face, but understanding kind of the state of what's available and what we can do. So thanks to the chief and the team at uh, MPD for, <laughs> for getting us that information and appreciate it on an ongoing yep. way. I agree. Who else? Okay. All right. Um, uh, so about the consent agenda, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so the consent agenda passes. Uh, so we are up to an appointment to the complete streets a group committee, uh, and I believe we just have one applicant uh, from Hanif Nazarali, who I believe is here. Uh, would you be up for just reintroducing yourself to us and just uh, tell us about your interest in joining this committee? Yeah, um, I have already served on the Complete Streets Committee, um, and I have a particular role on another committee, the Montpelier Transport Inf Infrastructure Committee, um, which I've been serving uh, serving on as a full member, whereas on Complete Streets, I'm an alternate. And over the two years, I think that I've been involved with both committees, um, I've developed a role of liaison. Um, so kind of trying to share information between the two committees and also distinguish uh, the specific uh, mandates of the committees on, on initiatives that we are taking. And actually, you'll be hearing about one of those initiatives that's a joint initiative uh, later on in the agenda today. Thank you. Uh, Connor. I'll move to uh, point Hanif as the alternate spot on the Complete Streets Committee. And I would just say um, thank you for all you do for the community. You really roll up your sleeves and do the work, not just Sit in meetings. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> I a second. Say, and I'll, yes, go ahead. And also add, he does a wonderful job of liaison between the two committees. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Thank you, Hanif. We appreciate your service um, on on this this committee and as a liaison. Uh, all right. All right, so we are up to uh, the Complete Streets presentation about uh, the Berry Street bike path pilot. And I think I'm turning this over either to Donna or possibly to Hanif. Um, <laughs> oh, Holly is Oh, OK. Thank you, Holly. Yeah. Holly, We're just there the you chaos. are. Sorry, okay, no, no, my no. apologies. No worries. I wonder, does Cameron hold the, the, the magic to allow me to share slides? And you're, you should be able to now, I think. Okay, great. First, um, I'd just like to thank the council for approving Hanif's appointment. Um, since moving to Montpelier in 2019, he has been a wonderful peer on the Complete Streets Committee, and we do deeply appreciate the translation he often makes for all of us uh, in his role as liaison. Um, and while I am tagged to present, I should say that uh, Donna Bate has given us good guidance in preparing this presentation, and it would not have been possible without the coordination of Hanif bringing the partners together, of Corey Lyons' expertise representing the Department of Public Works, 
Um, and Jonathan Weber, who is the Complete, Street, Complete Streets Program Manager for Local Motion, is also attending virtually. Jonathan has been a great partner to the Complete Streets Committee um, previously. Some of you may have remembered our e-bike lending pilot that occurred last summer. Um, Jonathan's uh, organization has been doing this type of work and assisting other Complete Streets Committees around the state for over 20 years. Uh, and he has been absolutely instrumental in helping us put together some of the information um, that you're gonna see in the presentation. So with that, I just have a few quick slides uh, to kind of assist this update. Um, so for everyone, this is uh, related to the 2019 endorsed Main Street and Barry Street Bicycle and Pedestrian Scoping Study. Um, this uh, is a two-way public bike lane between Main Street and where the current recreation um, center is uh, along Barry Street. Those of you following along a uh, front porch forum and around the turn of the year, um, may have noticed too a lot of lively discussion among residents about uh, currently some of the, the issues um, that this exact uh, study and solution are meant to resolve. So that study identified a long-term uh, solution and a short-term solution to improve safety circulation, the connectivity of people walking, cycling, and driving along this uh, section of Main Street and Berry Street. And I'm going to use a number of visuals, uh, which is the main reason for the slides to help illustrate this um, so everyone can kind of understand uh, what, what the numbers uh, will look like. So the long-term solution uh, is a 10 foot wide asphalt recreation path. This is basically an extension of the existing recreation path. Um, and the city has acquired the grant funding to design and construct that path. Uh, through the state's bicycle and pedestrian program. The project design consultant is anticipated to be selected in the coming weeks, and that design process um, will occur in parallel with the design of a new traffic signal at the Berry Street and Main Street intersection. That's the long-term solution. And I'm primarily gonna speak about the short-term solution. Um, but I'll, both of these have to deal with uh, this image. Um, so what you're seeing on the left-hand side is figure 50, and that is from page 45 of that scoping study. Um, and the inset to the right is a slightly larger version uh, of this. Um, and basically what you're looking at is the, the, uh, and the designed two-way bike path along the south side of Barry street between main street and again the recreation center and i'm using just a little bit of highlight there green to kind of show people where we are talking about and this is kind of another visual to give you an idea of what this is going to look like um, it's two-way you can see folks moving in both directions here on this um, with a small buffer uh, between vehicles driving along berry street and those using the bike path. So the short-term solution is a two-way bike path on the south side of Barrie, um, separated by pavement markings and temporary vertical element, uh, which you'll see in a moment. Um, and as mentioned, the Complete Streets Committee, uh, of which I am a member, I forgot to tell you that, um, has been working with uh, Jonathan at Local Motion uh, Corey and um, Hanif uh, and thinking about the design materials, the budget, lo lo logistics and implementation. Um, one of the added benefits of having the short term solution is going to be that um, we'll get insights. It'll help inform the long term solution, which is while designed, uh, we will obviously have a chance to help our residents um, and users of the bike path into getting acquainted with it and behavior change. The same for vehicle operators, um, and we should learn something in the process. Um, but again, this isn't meant to be a pilot. It is just the short-term solution to what is an established long-term solution. So our design considerations are that Barry Street is about um, just under 37 feet wide. Uh, the north side parking lane is seven feet wide. 
Um, the short-term solution calls for basically two nine and a half wide auto lanes. Uh, this is informed by the average annual daily traffic um, rating uh, that's done by the federal government, the DOT. That's the acceptable urban area width on low volume streets with little truck traffic, which is how Berry Street is, is defined um, by the AADT. And that leaves room for two four foot lanes and a two foot buffer. Um, and that is following the National Association of City uh, Traffic Official recommendations. And this is the same design as was used successfully in Burlington last year. Um, so Jonathan was able to give us precedent to make sure that this design is both nationally benchmarked and locally um, been tested successfully. This is um, a rendering basically of what this looks like. So from, I'm gonna go right to left, which is basically existing sidewalk and then the seven foot parking lane to two drive lanes, the vehicle operating lanes, the two foot buffer, and then the two four foot width lanes for the two way bike path. Um, so the materials involved in the implementation of this, um, there are the vertical elements. Those are meant to be uh, posts. They're slightly taller posts that will be placed 10 to seven feet apart. Um, we also thought about uh, an alternative to cones, uh, which are um, perhaps um, less distinct for this type of application. Uh, we wanted an element uh, that was a bit unique that would capture attention. Uh, so we've identified the wave delineators, which is a commonly used material for this exact type of implementation. Um, and this, these come with the added benefit that local motion has a number of them to lend to the project, which is great. Um, those can be supported by sandbags as well. Uh, then we have spent a lot of time discussing paint, both the tenure of paint, meaning how long it can last uh, once sprayed on the street. Um, and we have options between 30 days and six months for different applications in this. Um, if needed, it can be reapplied during the course of the um, short-term application this summer. And then local motion also has stencils and has advised on the markings um, in terms of style and color and placement. And Jonathan and Corey have coordinated very closely on um, which of these would make the most sense for Montpelier and um, to make sure that this is also the, the most cost-effective and safe um, type of installation. And then additionally, local motion has um, suggested signage at either end of the bike path, which is um, to include the signage of do not enter and bicycles only. Oh, and to, to the right-hand side basically is an example of this wave delineator. Uh, the illustration, you can see both its measurements. Um, they're each about 93 inches long, five and a half inches wide, and 27 and a half inches high and weigh about 11 pounds. So as I mentioned, uh, local motion is able to contribute uh, the wave delineators for us. Um, they may also be able to contribute the paint. Uh, Jonathan might have more recent information about that, but um, thought that that might be an option. Um, local motion will also be contributing information and outreach, the signage, including translation. The role of the Complete Streets Committee will help um, in uh, doing the public outreach and awareness building and coordinating volunteer support along with local motion for this. Um, and Corey has um, suggested that the $2,000 that may be needed for post and paint, if not available from local motion, um, is within, uh, within existing budget, basically. I'll leave Corey or others to inform on that. But basically, it may not even be this, uh, it may not even be $2,000 based on what local motion is able to contribute. So our next uh, steps as a team, um, coordinators of this, um, the city is to request that VTrans not stripe the center line on Barry Street this spring um, for the reason that we are narrowing those two lanes. Uh, local motion will support uh, Corey and staff with the materials and markings. 
There won't be markings at the Main Street intersection, but there will be conflict markings, which are basically to um, ensure that those using the, the few driveways that are impacted uh, on Berry Street to look both ways and recognize that there's a bike uh, lane there now. And um, uh, Corey is also gonna see about adding green markings to contractor work because I think currently it's only yellow paint that's used. Um, and again, our role uh, from the Complete Streets Committee is to work with Local Motion to help assemble all of the materials and develop a volunteer and communication plan. That's the update. Great. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, any questions uh, for Holly about the presentation? Yeah, Carrie. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am uh, really intrigued to see this plan and curious about how it's going to work. And then, so along those lines, I'm wondering um, what the plans are for kind of assessing how it's used, how many bicycles are using it, um, and kind of what the what the interplay is between the the cars that are there and the loss of parking spaces and the additional bicycle traffic, if, if there is any. I'm wholly unqualified to answer that question, Carrie. Um, I think it's a great one. I think it's probably something that we're going to have to talk more about in the Complete Streets Committee. Um, I would offer Jonathan uh, to suggest if this has been done, uh, such as in Burlington. Any examples to share with the council? Yeah, um, there certainly are. There are lots of ways to monitor bicycle traffic as well as vehicle speeds um, and also to collect qualitative data from users on how the infrastructure is working throughout the, the project. Um, I would, I would you know, say that for a project like this, which really is uh, an implementation of something that has already been endorsed by council for permanent installation, I would you know, wonder how that data would be used and, and for what purpose. Um, but you know, my recommendation would be to fit any kind of monitoring for bike traffic for this specific piece of infrastructure uh, into Montpelier's regular monitoring for bike traffic uh, if you're doing any now. Thank you, Jonathan and Carrie. Thank you for that that question. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, go um, ahead. Uh, we could also, uh, I don't, I don't want to speak for them, but we could also rely on our friends at the regional planning commission, um, to potentially do some data collection and some bike monitoring and that type of. Hey, Corey, would you mind introducing yourself? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Corey line <laughs> with, uh, public works. Great. Thank you. Yeah, Donna, go ahead. And, and just to add another thing that's there for cars is we'd be putting yellow, no parking bags over all the meters that are along the street the meters would stay because once this is gone and the full project comes then there's an expansion of that sidewalk to become a shared youth path and then the meters will be removed anyways great super um any other questions okay uh, any from the public okay uh all right uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is, I think, is very exciting, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing this in action uh, and using it, actually. So, all uh, right. Thanks again. And so we're going to move on now to uh, the next thing is the uh, temporary parklet ordinance for a second public hearing. Uh, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing on uh, this uh, as, as being our, our second time with this any thoughts from the public or council we'll start with um is there anything you wanted to add bill just for those that are um paying attention this is uh the last two summers we've enacted a an, uh, temporary ordinance for parklets in the downtown area um, and this would be the third summer that that temporary ordinance was enacted. This is the second public reading. Let the first public reading, it changed the start date from May 1 to April 15, and that is included here. And then we'll be working on a more permanent change uh, for a longer term. Okay. Great. Any comments from folks in person? I want to remind you, Steve Whitaker, I want to remind you that the uh, 
you need more clarity on when the business is closed that the public still gets to use the public space. That's particularly an issue, uh, I think, on Langdon Street or on, yeah, Langdon, uh, Maine. Uh, these, these folks put, you know, obstacles preventing the public from using the public space. And that needs to be explicitly prohibited. When the business is closed, the public gets to use the public space. And that has been agreed to conceptually, but not enforced and not made explicit in the temporary ordinance. So, um, and clarify the fire lane issue. And the cleaning, there's a lot of dust and crap builds up under these things and right on either end of them because the street sweepers can't get in and who's obligated to get in there and shovel that stuff out it it blows right into the food of the people sitting outside so now would be the time with arpa money to get that vacuum cleaner i told you about several years ago thank you anyone else in person okay uh and i'm just going to turn quickly to folks online i don't see any hands but just want to check anyone else uh online want to weigh in Okay. Any comments from council? Yeah, Connor, go ahead. Bill, would you be the point person if like businesses are wondering who to ask about the park lit or is there someone on yeah, staff? Our office. Okay, great. Our office, yeah. Yep. Mary's the point person, the city manager's office. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead, Donna. Time for a motion? I think it might be, yeah. That we um, we move ahead to the second reading. Oh no, this it was the second reading. Wow. Yeah, I, I guess the last time we talked about it, I didn't realize that was the first. All right. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, so I'd make a motion that we adopt the temporary. Read here, the, the temporary parklet ordinance as written. Second. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Um, all right, so thanks everybody, and I'm looking forward to hanging out in some parklets <laughs> at some point this summer. Uh, okay. Um, oh, thank you. I will close the public hearing on the temporary parklet ordinance. All right, on to the zoning revision. So this is our, our first uh, public hearing. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to officially open the public hearing on uh the zoning uh amendments and just so that folks know of the flow of this particular item uh we have a presentation from our um our planning director mike miller uh, so we'll go to him first <clears throat> um, after that we will uh hear I've, i'd like to hear uh, comments from the public uh, particularly and uh, I think we ought to take them um, one item at a time. So if folks have comments to make on on the first zoning change, we'll do that first and then we'll we'll wrap that up and move on um, to the other ones. And though this uh, the only anticipated vote uh, for this evening would be to put uh, here um, uh, a second public hearing on to our next agenda. Um, I will be recusing myself at least for the um, parts um, of this that uh, pertain to uh, Habitat for Humanity um, or a conflict of interest of mine. So, uh, so I'll turn to Jack to at least facilitate um, those parts. Um, all right. So, uh, but the first thing is uh, to hear from our planning director. Um, I can. Um, I think if there's anything else that needs to be said <laughs> while I stall for them. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I may move actually with this presentation. <clears throat> I have faith. Not. 
All right, so we're all set with that? Yeah. All right, excellent. Make sure everyone can hear me. It's good to be here in person again. Uh, my name is Mike Miller. I'm the planning director here for the city of Montpelier. And so tonight uh, I'm here to give the, the first introduction for everybody on the public hearing for amendments to the zoning and river hazard regulations. So really quick, um, I'm gonna try not to make too much of a, uh, keep this presentation short so we're not spending time here listening to me. We really wanna hear from the public, but I do wanna go through, explain what this hearing is about. Um, what is everything that happened? How did we get here? What are the official amendments that we'll be voting on? I'll go through the, the changes that were in the memo. Uh, it's, it's in your packet, it's available online. If you go to the city's main website, main webpage, uh, near the bottom on the left-hand side is a, is a set that has a, a link to all of the, the official changes. Um, and I'll be going through the memo, which has the 11 changes. Um, I'll describe the river hazard amendments and then we'll get to, to some public comments. So tonight, this is two hearings in one. So we are gonna be talking about changes that are being proposed to the unified development regulations. What everybody talks about is zoning bylaws, but by state statute, we have to call them unified development regulations. Um, and this will include changes to the zoning map, as well as changes to the text of the document. And changes are also being proposed to the river hazard area regulations, um, which is really permanently adopting the interim changes that council made in 2020 with one minor uh, reference addition that's been added to the rules for clarity. Uh, and a memo was provided in the packet describing each of these proposals in detail, and I will summarize each one, but anyone who's looked through that memo knows it's probably 16 pages long. I tried to put all the information in, so if somebody wants the details of a particular piece, they can have it, but I'm not going to go through all 16 pages here tonight. Um, so how did we get here? In the summer of 2021, staff started assembling a list of changes for consideration. Um, counselors who've been here for a number of years know about once a year, I'll be here to have these meetings to talk about making zoning changes. So. Um, this happens routinely. Um, on September 30th, the Planning Commission held a special meeting to review these changes and recommends one, ones to move to the hearing, which we did. Um, November 2021, we sent out notices to 330 property owners posted in newspapers and other required locations. And then on November 29th and December 13th, um, the Planning Commission held their public hearings. And it had good turnout um, and they had good comments. And then January 10th and 24th, the PC had Planning Commission had some deliberations uh, before February 14th, where the Planning Commission considered some amendments, including what you'll hear about later on, the Sabins Pasture Addition. Um, so they voted to make an addition in addition to what had already been considered, and then voted to council for you guys to, to make a consideration of that. So what is officially being voted? While we talk a lot about the memo, um, the memo uh, really tries to explain what the implications and outcomes of the change will be. Um, but the official zoning document is the complete strike through that is found on the website, plus the revised zoning map. Um, so a lot of those are, are rather minor. It might just be a strike through of, of three or four words, but I, I describe the impacts of what that strikeout will be. But the official, what we're officially, when we vote, to amend the zoning, that's what's officially being voted. And for River Hazard, there's an official document in online again, um, which includes the edits that are highlighted texts, it wasn't a strike through document, it's highlighted, plus the interim river corridor map, which was what was amended in 2020. Um, so I'll go through these really quick. Um, and I just did want, want to preface this up front, up front that when I talk about a proposal that has come forward that spurred this. Uh, the Planning Commission has always been, was, was very clear that as they were reviewing these, it's not reviewing to approve or deny these projects. Some of these ideas for a zoning change came out because of a project, but really they're looking at this request in the context of 
um, our master plan and the, the bigger picture. So it's obviously sometimes hard to disconnect the two, um, but they, they did try to go and look at what, what is in the best interest of the community and not whether or not we are approving or denying a particular project. Um, so zoning change number one, um, for folks trying to get oriented a little bit, you'll see there's a, um, the road kind of coming through here, that's Main Street, that's North Street, and this is Loomis Street. So this is a uh, little road, Harrison Ave and Whittier. Um, and so there are 20 parcels on these, including three that are on Loomis Street. It's the area that's labeled 9-3. It's currently residential six. It is part of the College Street neighborhood, even though it's not really near College Street, it is in that neighborhood. And the proposal is to change that to Res 3 and be part of the Liberty Street neighborhood, Liberty Street East neighborhood. It would allow a modest increase in housing, not inconsistent with the area. We had um, limited public comments about this, but it was overall supportive. Excuse me, Mike. Uh, yep. When you mention these different levels like Res 3, Res 4, Res 6, could you, for people who aren't, unfamiliar, aren't familiar, could you mention what those terms mean? Sorry, thank you, Jack, I should have done that. Um, so our zoning, we weren't very creative when we were putting together the zoning. It used to be medium density, low density, high density, and we had so many districts, we really couldn't use those. So what we ended up doing was distinguishing districts based on lot size or density. So res six, is uh, short for residential 6,000, which means it has a 6,000 square foot minimum lot size and requires one, uh, you can have a density of one unit per 6,000 square feet. So um, that would adjust to residential three, which means you could have a 3,000 square foot lot um, and one unit per 3,000 square foot of property. Um, and so in, in this particular case, of the 20 properties, I believe there were four properties that had parcels that were smaller than 6,000 square feet. So they would have been non-conforming parcels by going to residential 3,000 that makes them conforming parcels. So um, that's uh, a little bit of the basis. And if people have any other questions about that, please feel free to, to interrupt me and let me know. So zoning, the second zoning change, and this map looks very similar to the last one because it's it's just below it, but is actually looking at Heaton Street. So where the 9-8 is, um, you'll see a, a road that's turning, that's Heaton Street, where Heaton Hospital and Heaton Woods Long-Term Care Facility are located. So this will affect two parcels. Um, it'll shift them again from residential 6,000 to residential 3,000, same, same discussion as before. These properties, um, were defined by staff and um, by the Planning Commission as, as being unique. They don't really um, fit the residential 6,000 character um, because it's the, it's the old hospital and the, and the long-term care facility. So we decided that um, this was initiated by Washington County Mental Health Project to renovate the old hospital into 18 units plus five units next to the parking lot. And they can't do that at the residential 6,000 density. So by shifting it to a residential 3000, they will be able to move forward with their project. So that was what initiated it and spurred it. And um, staff reviewed <clears throat> the current size of the properties and the buildings and found that it would be consistent with creating a new neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, a new neighborhood for them because it's a slightly different, um, unique set of properties. Public comments were mixed on this at the Planning Commission level. Um, and we can go into that a little bit more, or we may hear some, some additional comments on that. Um, some of it was uh, the result of some miscommunication between um, Washington County Mental Health and the staff who were preparing the materials for the public. Um, and then when we got to the hearing, uh, we got a slightly different version of what their project was. So our presentation didn't match what their proposal was. So the third change, this involves two parcels. Um, this is Northfield Street, where you see 7-4 is uh, Northfield Street that's coming up. That pink parcel is, um, uh, is uh, I believe, where um, the Econo Lodge is. So this is across the street. Um, so this is a 58-acre parcel. Um, and so this involves two parcels. Um, 
and plus moving a small area out of the design review district. The small parcels were in mixed use residential. The large parcel where 11-7 is, um, is currently in rural, and we are going to shift that to a residential 9,000 under this proposal. It was initiated by a Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity project, um, which many people may have heard about. Um, the change is really based on access to sewer and water, which would be extended with this project. So um, there's not, uh, there, there's this uh, site that has a lot of steep slopes um, and, and has some challenges, but there are portions of it that could be developed if sewer and water were extended. And uh, as has been done in other places in the city, um, Crestview being one, um, there are places that have these internal parcels that have access to sewer and water. And as a rule of thumb, um, in, in planning, you usually um, have at least a minimum zoning density of four units per acre if you're going to have sewer and water. And the reason for that is it provides enough um, customer base to support the long term maintenance of those sewer and water lines. So if it's a lower density, then those lines end up being subsidized by other other people. So there's usually a rule of thumb. If you're going to run sewer and water into an area, it should have a, a one unit, um, four units per acre, uh, which would be a residential 10,000. This is residential 9,000, which is our closest. So um, that's the rule of thumb. That's why we have recommended going to the residential 9,000. Uh, comments were generally negative at the Planning Commission towards the zoning change, but positive towards the Central Vermont Habitat Project. I'm sure we're going to go into this in much more detail later. Um, the challenge is um, the Habitat for Humanity needs the zoning change in order for their project to work. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of a, a catch-22, but we can um, comment and discuss this a little bit more later. Before you leave yeah. this, this picture, what's the eleven seven? You may have explained it, and I missed. Uh, so these the, the the numbers that we've had before, I can't remember the ones in the previous ones, um, but the eleven seven that is the neighborhood designation. So we when we did the zoning changes in two thousand and seventeen, one thing we did was to um, break the the entire city into many, many small neighborhoods of very similar um, conditions. Um, you, so you see the 9-6 above, that's um, Prospect Street and Pleasant Street and Cherry Street. So those all kind of have a very similar um, um, use and feel and context. So they were grouped as one neighborhood and 11-7 is part of the Colonial Drive neighborhood. Um, because it's the most, um, it's, it's the adjacent um, neighborhood to that, and most of those are the that density. So just to go back to that, I made a wrong correlation in your other maps of when, when the second number was a, a three or a six, I thought that meant that 3,000. It, it wasn't, it no, was a res three, it's yeah, totally it's, neighborhoods. It's, it's referring to, the other number is just referring to the the legend in the the zoning map okay. so my Thank apologies you. about that confusion um, so the fourth and fifth changes these will go a little bit faster um, the uh, number four is to reduce the side setbacks in residential 9000 district from 15 to 10 feet residential 9000 has many neighborhoods in in montpelier um, it's it's down you know you go out any road and you're going to end up in a res 9 district um, and the issue is when you have these zoning rules is sometimes it doesn't, it, it may match for many, but not all of those different neighborhoods. And we found there are a few neighborhoods where the 15 foot setback did create some uh, non-conformities for the side setbacks. And side setbacks can impact density tremendously because it keeps separating structures, each structure. And if you've, you're at 15 feet and they're at 15 feet, that makes each house 30 feet apart. And if you've got ranch style houses, you just start watching the the density kind of drop as it pushes pushes apart and apart and apart. So the idea is, if we had the ten foot, it'll reduce the number of nonconformities and and help to uh, allow for more compact developments. Um, number five is about rail setbacks in the Eastern Gateway District. Um, it will be five feet instead of twenty feet, so it currently is twenty feet, um, and there's a ton of nonconformities in there. Um, most of them are zero feet already. 
So the rules are that it would be five feet instead of 20 feet, but it can be zero if the property owner gets an agreement with the state rail division to allow for maintenance. So this will eliminate many nonconformities and was initiated by one of the major property owners in the area um, because they have ideas for some expansion, nothing specific at this time, but they, they recognized that there was a problem with this 20 foot setback and they wanted to get that fixed. And we didn't have any comments except for the property owners in, in that area who support it. Number six and number seven, talk about planned unit developments. So number six is about creating two new planned unit development types. So when we developed our zoning in 2017, 18, when it was finally adopted, we didn't have any just general PUD rules that allow us to cluster lots. Um, we, you, if you wanted to do some clustering lots, you had to do one of these specific um, cottage cluster or new neighborhood or, or very specific types. So what we did here was to just add in some general ones. The general PUDs is that clustering of lots idea that, that you'll see sometimes um, with projects where you, you, you own a couple acres and you just wanna cluster the lots at the front and leave the back um, as open space. Um, this would allow you to do it. You don't get any density bonuses um, because it's just, just giving you your benefit of being able to cluster those lots. The footprint PUD applies to some condominium projects. I took a quick look today through our tax maps. I didn't see that we have any footprint PUDs currently in Montpelier, but it does happen, especially you'll see these if, if you ever um, had, you know, went to a timeshare in, in Stowe or in um, some of the ski resorts. That's, it's a common thing where um, how you would set up a condominium is by actually subdividing that lets you own the building in the condo as opposed to um, owning the rights to the building in the condo so it's um, it's it's pretty typical we probably won't get a lot of them but we added it in number seven is to remove the required PUDs not the first time you guys have heard this um, this is something I've been pushing for since since they were adopted so there are two PUDs, the conservation and the new neighborhood PUD, both of which require you at a certain number to use that PUD. So if you do four or five lots in the conservation district, you have to then do a conservation PUD. And if you do 40 units over 10 years in, in a different district, you're forced to the new neighborhood PUD. Um, another rule of thumb, I, I try to use, I encourage when we're writing regulations and doing things is make the projects that you want to have happen be the ones that are the easiest to do. Required PUDs is the opposite of that. We want people to cluster lots, but if you want to cluster lots, then we're going to make you do a lot more work and make the process a lot harder. So I've, I've said, I don't think there's gonna be very many people who will ever do any of our PUDs, but if they do, it should be voluntary. The other thing you will find, um, and, and I've seen this in other communities, is if you set that threshold, you can only do, um, let's say it's 40. You'll see people who will come in and say, I was gonna do 60, but I'm gonna do 39 so I can avoid that requirement. Did we really help ourselves when we could have gotten a much bigger and better project but they wouldn't be able to build that project under the PUD, so they backed it down to avoid doing the PUD. So um, I've argued that I would rather get these, the requirements removed. You'll still have those as an option, but remove the requirements. They're also difficult to administer over time because you're tracking the number of lots over 10 years. Um, I'll leave that for my memo, um, but if there are questions, I can get into that. The Planning Commission also wanted to note that number three, when we talked about Northfield Street, and number seven, this one here to remove required PUDs could be applied differently. Now the Planning Commission's recommendation is to go to residential 9000 on Northfield Street and to eliminate the required PUDs. But they did wanna recognize that people could go through and say, well, we could keep the required PUD and then require the folks on Northfield Street to go through the through the PUD process. The, the problem is the conservation PUD, which is when they would be required to go through, would only offer them 25 units, um, which is half of what they need to, to basically make their project viable. Um, so while this is a, a, a technically a possible thing, it 
um, functionally would still kill that project if which is why the planning commission ultimately recommended it but they did want to note that there were there was this other alternative that would have required um, that that they cluster and conserve land um, so changes eight and nine eight um, is another one that you've you've um, received a lot of testimony on written and we'll probably hear some more on this is the removal of the residential density in the residential 1500 and riverfront district so as the numbers get smaller just so people in in your minds is a little counterintuitive so as the numbers get smaller lots get smaller and densities get bigger so more units can be on residential 1500 than residential 3000 there are more units on a residential 3000 than 6000 so just so people can understand these numbers aren't getting less dense, they're getting more dense. So this would remove the residential density requirement in those two districts. This is a planning commission proposal and the planning commission profession currently is evolving away from using density as, uh, as it is arbitrary and can, be, can have unforeseen negative outcomes. So the idea is instead to let design standards define character. Um, this was, reviewed by AARP and CNU, uh, which is, AARP is actually the name of the organization now, I believe, um, and CNU is the Congress of New Urbanism. Um, they were randomly just going through and picking communities um, right. to review, and unbeknownst to us, they reviewed Montpelier, our rules. Um, and when we discussed this, they talked about that this was a good idea, um, but caution that we need better design standards. Now, this happened after the planning commission um, and we didn't get their report until after the planning commission's memo so you do have a memo um, but they didn't have the benefit of the 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 report to actually quote and reference so um, i did did want to point that out that we had a meeting i relayed the information that i heard in that meeting to the planning commission who had the conversations um, there's been i think a lot made and there might be some some stuff made about the, the fact that the staff myself did not recommend this um, citing the need for better standards first uh, and while I, I think there's a lot that's been made that um, there's a disagreement between the planning commission and myself uh, we both agree this is um, moving away from density requirements is a good idea and we both uh, agree and i agree with that the question is um, whether or not we believe everything is um, we have the design standards in place today that would prevent bad things from happening. I'm not sure. Um, th their opinion is that um, this isn't a big problem for us. And I can agree we haven't had um, big problems that have come up with um, directly with this. But at the same time, I'm the person who has to sit in the seat and go and say, am I comfortable? telling people that everything is going to be fine. And I can't guarantee that we wouldn't have problems that would result. And that's why I'm, I feel we should get the design standards first and then move towards removing the density. The planning commission is comfortable moving, headed, moving ahead now and fixing the design standards over time because these design issues haven't been a problem. And I think staff or, or Planning commissioners are online who can comment on that later if you guys want to directly address them. I believe Kirby and I think I saw Aaron were both online if you want to directly um, address things with them. So nine are the minor technical fixes. I'll just skip through most of these except to say we got a lot of comment on the solar access, um, which uh, we can go into more detail a little bit. Um, so the solar access was an issue because um, the, the way the solar access rules are written today, you cannot shade yards, walls, or roofs. So um, it became very strict to go through and say, you know, not only can the new building, if we want to have infill development, it's very quick to have a shadow from the top of that roof that's going to trip over a property line and shade any amount on December 21st that would not meet the rules so the planning commission um we, we had a discussion planning commission decided with staff recommendations that we would adjust it to uh that we would be protecting solar existing and proposed solar devices um and not the broader walls yards and roofs so that's the change there 
which I'm sure we will hear some more about as well. So I skipped from nine to 11. That's because 10 was our river hazard, which we'll go back to. So uh, it's a little bit faded in, in what we can see here, but if you look carefully, you will see there's both a yellow line. Let me get in here. There's my yellow line coming up and over. This is Sabin's pasture. And you'll see Berry Street along the bottom of the screen here. And you'll also see a new green line. Let's see if I can get my cursor over here again. And I can't really do that. So um, there is a green line that's right next to it. So um, the, this is, there was a proposal at the end um, for, to change the riverfront boundary in Sabin's Pass pasture to bring, it, bring in the eastern line 40 feet and move out the part of the northern line by 90 feet. So I think you can see the green line in there that kind of juts out at the top. Um, these are all internal boundary adjustments. So Sabin's pasture is 100 acres in size and 15 acres of which was cut out to be in the riverfront. This was the compromise that was worked out by city council in 2017. Um, but when, there, when the um, property owners were starting to look at some development projects that they're exploring, they noticed that the riverfront district is actually only 14.1 acres. And there was some pieces that were undevelopable and there's a little piece to the north where the bump out is that would allow them to put in one additional um, structure that they were trying to fit into the, the bottom. Um, they needed uh, the additional land to fit in the one more building. So they requested after we had closed the public hearings. Um, so the planning commission, because we knew that the owners of Saban's pasture were going to come in and present it to city council. That would automatically trigger the fact that city council would then have to send it back to the planning commission for comment. So the planning commission can comment on it to send it back to city council. So to kind of cut out that loop, and it was the day they were going to be voting to send the entire amendment to you, they just reviewed it at that time to go through and say, this is a minor amendment. Um, and you should you city council with us should um, be aware that there was not specific comment at the planning commission level and you guys should do some extra outreach. Um, we sent the planning department sent letters to every abutter to Saban's pasture. So they have been notified of the change. Um, and just so you get a little bit of context, that northern line is 1,300 feet from the southern boundary of Leapfrog Hollow Parcel. So there is a lot of land that is in between those two. It is 850 feet from the nearest parcel line on McKinley Street. And it's a couple hundred feet from the parcel you see right there. So it's a... Um, because um, that parcel line along the top is 500 feet. So you can see it's, it's almost 300 feet probably just to get to um, the parcel next to it. So the thought from the Planning Commission was it was a relatively minor adjustment um, and they are, they are in support of making this adjustment. It still continues to be four, uh, less than the 15 acres. So uh, at the time City Council said we want 15 acres of riverfront, we want 85 acres of rural, the, uh, it didn't work out that way and ended up with 14.1 acres. By making this adjustment, it will be 14.5 acres of riverfront. So, all right, almost there. One step back, we go to, to number 10, which was the river hazard area changes. So these were the interim rules um, passed in January of 2020. Those rules describe what rules apply to accessory structures in the river corridor. And we made a process for waivers. Um, this was because River corridors are only uh, only appear north of Cumming Street um, on the north branch. That's the only place we have a river corridor. It's the only place it's enforced. But if somebody is in a river corridor and they want to put a shed or they want to put um, some small accessory structures, the rules weren't clear that they could do it. And so we established some some rules that said, all right, these are the things you can put into a river corridor. Uh, it also changed the map on Cumming Street because there was a portion of the uh, river corridor that went on the other side of Cumming Street. And according to the rules the state uses to draft these maps, roads are supposed to be hard boundaries. So if a river corridor crosses it, they always clip it. And for some reason, it never got clipped. So when we made the proposal, we made that change. And then there's the one text change that I referred to, which really helps people find the section about accessory structures. 
So um, this is um, this is it. So let me go through and just say I, I know the process is typically we would hear, uh, get questions from the council and questions from the public. I guess it's up to you guys how you want to handle it. And the next hearing is April 13th. So there is at least one more hearing on this. There can be as many as you want. I remember when we did this in 2017, we had 20, 22 of them, I believe. <laughs> So those were, those were the good old days when you saw me every week. So I'll open open to questions, I guess. It's not snowing. <laughs> okay. Well, just uh, to start here, are there clarifying questions? Uh, not necessarily a time for opining, but clarifying questions uh, from council. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Sure, Mike. Uh term character of the neighborhood comes up all the time and it feels like yes. it's being a no-brainer to like what's the character of the neighborhood but i wonder is there like a written definition of that or if not how do you see the character of the neighborhood i think it could be a bit subjective maybe so it can be a bit subjective and it's actually one of the one of the the um i guess some of the one of the fundamental pieces of when you're writing regulations, you can write things to be objective or you can write things to be subjective and objective standards we can then put into the administrative category and, and Audra and Meredith can process those. But certain things we want flexibility and we need the ability to to let reasonable persons decide what is appropriate and character of the area is one of those classics that always falls into the we need to let a, the reasonable person make that determination. So that's why those always go to the DRB. That's part of conditional use review. That said, um, because it comes up a lot and it is a legal term, there is something that's the, the Quichi decision from Southern Vermont that came out a couple decades ago now that, that attorneys would know about. And it really just looks at the whether it's an undue adverse effect upon so they kind of break it into pieces and ask the first question well is it you know is is this adverse is this undue and that's what we try to do and so within our zoning for each one of those 57 neighborhoods that i talked about so we broke the city into 57 we, we put a small descriptor in there of what is kind of the character of that neighborhood it's a historic neighborhood it's a you know a, a has mostly single family homes it's mixed use it's um so that way the drb gets a sense of okay here's what we think of as the character of the neighborhood now is this proposal undue having an adverse effect upon that that character it is vague but it is a pretty standard um practice and is in virtually every every um every zoning regulation that's helpful thanks any other questions from council? Yeah, Jack. Thanks for this presentation, Mike. Um, I've got a few questions, mostly about uh, number eight, okay. I think, because you know, there's been discussion both uh, in your presentation and on the, by the comments about the the report from, what is it, C, CNU and AARP. Um, is is this the report that you're talking about here it says enabling better places a zoning guide for vermont neighborhoods or is there something specific to our zoning ordinance uh there's something specific to our zoning ordinance and i think i forwarded it today unless that didn't make it um i think i sent it up to mary and bill and maybe it didn't it may not have made it into the packet. I, I had been sending out a lot of stuff and somebody asked me if I'd sent it to council and I was like, I don't remember if that was one of my. Okay, thanks. But I don't it, there is a specific document. Um, it's enabling better places, code reform roadmap for Montpelier, Vermont. Oh, great. I, I don't recall seeing it, but of course I was also working today, but, <laughs> uh, but I think that would be a good thing to uh, Make sure the council has it. Make sure it's on the uh, on the city's web page. So anyone else who's interested in this, because I noticed that wasn't wasn't a link in in your presentation to it. There wasn't a link in the commenters' presentation to it. And so that would be good to have. Um, but following on that uh, uh, on that track, what I understand the a primary comment is that the current uh, zoning bylaw does not give enough uh, design guidance to protect 
the neighborhoods from uh, from bad consequences that might happen if uh, if we get rid of the uh, the density requirement. And so I looked a little bit at the uh, zoning bylaw and and the zoning bylaw does have district has uh, developmental guidelines and standards for each type of neighborhood um, so that 2.108 or 2108 talks about uh, residential 1500 uh, and 2104 talks about uh, riverfront and there are descriptions there's the section of environmental standards and uh, and there are descriptions of some of the things that seem kind of detailed like the building facade shall be composed of modules or bays that incorporate visible changes feature a regular pattern of windows it it all seems like it's it's kind of detailed and uh and so i wonder why that isn't enough so or those seem to be enough like yeah that. so those standards were are uh, applicable only to very specific projects so if something is a major site plan then those rules will start to be applied but they're not in the design review district where there's a committee that's going to review them so in some cases um, a project will be big enough have enough square footage that it'll trigger a major site plan and those rules will apply but if somebody's doing infill um in 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 doing a number of smaller structures they could avoid meeting it needing to meet any of the architectural standards okay that gets me to my next question, which is design review. It seems like whenever there's a discussion of design review, there's a fight because there are people who want to be in design review and people who don't want to be in design review. And uh, and nobody's seems like nobody's happy with, with the way it comes out because obviously if you don't want to be in design review, that means you don't want the city telling you what to do with your property more than it already is. So if we if we go down the track of saying, well, we're gonna expand design review and expand standards, where does that lead us? Leads us to another fight, right? <laughs> yeah, you've been doing this long enough, Jack. Um, I, I would, my experience has been um, that that expanding we had proposed in in 2016 i think of of expanding the design review district and through the zoning process the design review district um, kept getting smaller so instead of we, we couldn't even maintain the size of the existing um district because we had to remove places which was disappointing um but uh, again i think that's it's a reasonable balance to think about expanding the design review to cover some of these areas to resolve that issue. Um, but it, I think we would have to have a discussion about the, the bigger process. What would you want? If we were going to do that, I don't think we could just simply add that to the list. I think that's something we would have to go through and it would have to go back to the planning commission. Then when it comes back to council, I think we would have to, you know, if I were recommending a process to you, I'd recommend we'd have to probably notify with a letter to everybody in those districts that we were going to consider expanding them and adding them in. Um, and the last proposal to do that, I think, is the the most full that I've had for it was a planning commission public hearing that filled this entire room um, when the last time we expanded or proposed expanding. So I would expect a similar thought process. Thanks. That's all I have for the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Other questions? You go ahead, Connor. Yeah, sure. I might be a bit daft on number three. Uh, so people liked the habitat project. They did like the zoning changes that would enable the habitat project to go forward. What am I missing? Is that the Bove property too? No, okay. nothing. There's no Bove, no Bove anything in this. <laughs> um, so the concern, and, and I'm I'm going to be giving you you know reading into other people's comments um and so i'm sure they will correct me if i if i don't hit this correctly for you um their concern is that if we do the zoning change to allow this project to happen and then habitat's project fails 
uh, any developer can come in and take advantage of this new high density and can put uh, 270 units out there. You know, the reality is there's a lot of steep slopes out there and there's not going to be 270 units um, sitting in there because just because of how steep it is. But, um, you know, from a from a number standpoint, yes, uh, it would be open to the next the next person who comes along. Um, our position has been um, as, as staff and what we know of the, the project, they're doing their um, feasibility study, Habitat is. Uh, and they need to have the rules in place to know it costs a couple hundred thousand dollars to put together and do these plans and designs and what you can feasibly do. And they really can't make that investment if they don't know that they're going to get the zoning change to happen, because that, that's a lot of money to invest without having that assurity that the zoning can change. So this is a proposal to change the zoning to allow them to move forward with the planning, knowing their, the, the parameters that they have to meet. So, oh, oh, Donna, back to that. Now, if it's property specific, is that what you call spot zoning? This was t uh, technically a shift of two parcels, but that's I mean, really splitting. It becomes an but exception yeah. versus. Yeah, so spot zoning is a common, um, and let me qualify stuff now. Um, I talk a lot about some some legal standards and, and legal stuff, and um, as a part of being. AICP certified planner. I'm required to take law classes every year. So I'm familiar with law, but I am not actually a licensed lawyer. So I will give you comments based on my amateur um, um, stuff. But spot zoning is it, it's it's an expression and a thing that a lot that is used commonly, but doesn't actually have a legal legal piece. The the fundamental behind a spot zoning is you or the opposite of that. What the court looks for is to treat people of similar character, of similar circumstance, they should be treated in a similar manner. So you should not single out a, a parcel to go through and say, this one is going to get special standards, even though they're not a special property. So that would be spot zoning, even if we don't, even if it's not a legal thing. That's what usually we're talking about is, is either making special exceptions to make um, make it better for them or making special exceptions to make it worse for them. Um, so this, even though it's just one parcel and it's shifting it, it is, it is part of the abutting parcel. And there's a logic behind why it's changing, which is running sewer and water in means it shouldn't be zoned rural. You shouldn't be running sewer and water into a rural area because they're gonna run the sewer and water in, we should rezone that to residential 9,000 to make sure that we get a sufficient density that that utility is properly utilized. Um, and so that's not, even though we're changing one parcel, it is still gonna be consistent with the neighbors. Um, it's not being treated inconsistent with, you know, there's not a similar parcel next to it that's of similar, in a similar situation with similar conditions. So you talk about one parcel, but basically it's like what you were talking about, Savings Pasture. It's sort of moving the line. On Savings Pasture, you move the riverfront, and here you want to move the line. So yeah, you're just including or excluding a piece of property in a, in a neighboring zone. Yeah, he, yeah, it's being, yeah, it could be lumped in with the, its neighbors on Hill Street, which are rural, or it could be lumped into its neighbors on uh, Colonial Drive, which are residential nine. Um, I like that better than exception thing. <laughs> Other questions, Lauren? Yeah, thanks. I just had a couple um, on some of the ones that I um, anticipate not having as many public comments on, just for some clarity. Um, for the rail setback, just I know there's been some conversation about um, increasing commuter rail, for example, between Barrie and Montpelier. Like, are there any concerns or any conflicts you foresee if we actually did ramp up rail usage in the future, or would you not anticipate any? I wouldn't expect any. Most of these properties, um, so if I, if I didn't include the map in it because it was really hard to see, most of the areas that we are talking about are um, where the bike path is mm -hmm. on that abandoned section. So this is over just past um, the, the harvest equipment. So once you get past harvest equipment, 
that rail line still continues all the way up till it stops at Gallison Hill. So all of those buildings that are on um, Malone's properties, uh, Cabot, um, all of those properties, all about an abandoned rail line, and they all have a 20 foot setback. So most of what we're talking about is abandoned rail lines, not active rail lines, but they're still owned by the state. They're not going to give them up. So um, they, those are fine. There are a couple Agway um, and the um, Two Rivers property. So again, if somebody comes in, and wants to go and build a zero lot line on the active rail line, chances are better that they're not going to get an agreement from the um, from the state unless it is a rail. It's for a rail use. So in other words, I'm, I'm going to put a rail siding on and I'm going to put something right on the rail line so I could take advantage of that siding. Um, rail probably isn't going to let them build up to the zero lot line um, and even if they did get the agreement, this, the waiver still has to go to the DRB to get the approval. Um, so I don't, I don't think, I don't foresee any issues with that. Thank you. Um, on the solar um, shading proposal, I guess the only question I had, you know, so it, it looks like the proposal is for existing or permitted, so like in the process. I mean, is there any way I hate to like lose solar potential in the city, like if you're shading someone's whole roof or something. <laughs> so I, I get and I, you know, I can just imagine how difficult this issue is to measure and whatever. But I mean, if there's some substantial shading of potential solar opportunity where you're shading out your neighbor from being able to go solar is is there some ground in there that I mean, it's different if you're like you described, you know, going dipping onto the property line is one thing, but shading someone's roof or something yeah. is another. Yeah. So the planning commission, I, I laid out a couple options for them to consider. Um, and the discussion really came up with uh, if one of our number one goals is to is to try to make sure we get these infill projects going. A lot of these are going to very quickly end up, especially if it's a two story or a three story building, very quickly start shading the other side. So they didn't want the shading requirement, especially on properties that have trees um, to end up, you know, there's no there's very little solar potential because there's already a lot of trees, but it's going to shade the other property. Um, they kind of went back and forth as to where they would draw that line. And I, I kind of drew a couple of lines in the sand and said, well, one I could guarantee we would need to do or we really should do is to make sure we protect existing and proposed solar projects. We really shouldn't cross that line and then kind of had a bunch of options on the way back down. Um, and, and their decision was if we if, if we really want infill. Um, we are downtown. We have a lot of trees. We have a lot of topography. The buildings are going to only occasionally be the problem. Um, people are more likely to have problems with these other issues of topography and, and, and trees. So their, their vote was, and their recommendation is therefore to just go with um, protecting the existing and proposed. Yeah, go for it. Um, on the planned unit developments, um, so you said, you know, it makes sense that we don't want to effectively discourage people from doing clustered buildings paired with conservation. Are there policies and, you know, maybe it's just something to be thinking about, but are there ways that we could be encouraging that with incentives or penalizing what we don't want to see of spread out fragmenting development? Um, I mean, are, are there strategies you've seen of successful ways to encourage that, which it seems like was probably the intention of this? Um, I don't know if I have a good answer for that one. Um, usually developers are going to try to go and, and, and do things. And I haven't seen a lot here in Montpelier that are, you know, um, kind of wastefully subdivided, subdividing in such a way. Usually they're going to, they're going to look at the lot and the topography and kind of subdivide in what makes sense for their for their property. Um, so uh, I think putting in the general PUD is a big first step and a, and a big help because now you can do it without getting caught up. 
I think as things stand now, without our general PUD, somebody is really forced into doing small subdivisions because otherwise, if they do large subdivisions, they're forced to conserve land um, that that may be viable for um, subdivision or development in the future. Um, and so I think they would probably do things to avoid um, triggering that. Um, but some of my issues are with the fact that it's just difficult to track and administer over time. So that I think is the, the trickier piece of those existing ones. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any. All right, so we are gonna uh, turn now to the public uh, and we'll do each of these uh, proposed changes one at a time in order. So we'll start with number one, the Harrison Ave rezoning. Um, we'll start with folks who are here in person and then check to see if anyone online uh, wishes to comment on that particular uh, topic and then we'll, we'll keep moving through all of them. Uh, all right, so um, Harrison Ave rezoning, anyone um, wish to speak to that? Okay, I am not seeing anyone and anyone online. Okay, not seeing anyone there either. Uh, all right, so we're gonna move on then uh, to number two, the Heaton Street rezoning. Uh, anyone in person wish to speak to the Heaton Street uh, rezoning? Uh, yes, if you'd like, come on up. And if you would uh, say your name, where you live and uh, Let's try to keep your comments to two minutes, if you can. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on these proposed revisions. I'm Thomas Weiss, resident of Montpelier, Liberty Street. And I attended the meetings of the Planning Commission about a year in 2015 and 16, submitting comments and speaking about the proposals then to amend our zoning bylaws, which was a major overhaul of the bylaws. And then I did make comments at both of the public hearings last autumn. So I believe that moving Heaton Street into the residential 3000, um, yes, residential 3000 district is premature. It turns out that up to 19 dwelling units can be built on that parcel, that's the Washington County Mental Health Parcel and still comply with the standards relating to coverage and floor area ratio in its present, in its present residential 6,000 district. And I will have a, a written document that I'll provide tomorrow. I've learned a couple things tonight that I'll need to change the document around, um, but not these parts. Um, a portion of the lot needs to remain open because of the existing buildings and impervious structures. And that leaves a certain additional area that may be used for new structures for housing. Nine units may be built at the standard density of 6,000 square feet per unit. And if one goes for the bonus for the cottage cluster, that could allow 19 units on, on the property. And um, that seems like a adequate room on the site for an ample number of dwelling units. And I, Mr. Miller put it into a document that I read. I don't remember that he, he said it tonight, is that we're, we're not zoning for a particular project or a particular individual or organization. We're zoning for, for what's best for the neighborhood. So, um, but the bonus, bonus for the cottage cluster, I don't know, is only available if you don't do number five, because number five takes out infill development, if I remember correctly, and it takes out cottage clusters. So it's, it, it's kind of a conundrum there uh, as to what do you leave in and what do you leave out of the zoning. So anyway, I request that city council reject this proposed amendment for nine Heaton Street. And I have a similar argument for uh, moving 10 Heaton Street into the residential 3000 district is also premature. And sorry for the uh, paper crinkling to the people who are getting that in their ears. 52 dwelling units can be built on the Heaton Woods parcel 
and still comply with those same standards of uh, relating to uh, lot coverage and floor area ratio in the present district. Um, so I request that the city council reject this proposed amendment to 10 Heaton Street, which would take care of not doing, I'm asking you not to do number two at all. Um, I, I believe that no one has proposed or is considering a project there. And I believe the only reason that this came up is so that we didn't end up with a residential 3000 enclave at 9 Heaton Street, totally surrounded by uh, the residential 6000. But again, um, I think there's plenty of room for plenty of housing on that property without rezoning it. So those are my comments on number two. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else um, wish to comment on number two, uh, the Heaton Street? Okay, anyone online wish to uh, comment on Heaton Street? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, for number three, I'm gonna turn it over to Jack. Okay, number three is the uh, Northfield Street parcel for the use described, uh, requested by uh, by Habitat for Humanity. Um, Jennifer Tose, I noticed you had your hand up earlier, so why don't you uh, go ahead? Hi, thanks. This is Alan Johnson uh, here with my wife, Jennifer Tose. We live on the uh, very end of Pleasant Street. And for those who are not familiar, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that most folks listening are familiar. If you're not, let me know, and I'd be happy to describe, or maybe someone else there can describe it. Um, the couple concerns that we have, uh, my, my, so first and foremost, for, for my own background, I'm very much in favor of you know affordable housing developments and uh, doing well by our community in that way. Um, I think it goes a long way for the community, not just for the folks living in those houses, but for, for everybody. And I have been um, to a presentation where uh, Zach from um, Habitat for Humanity uh, described the project, and it seems very reasonable to me. And our concerns generally are around what might happen uh, should that project not go through. So um, I'm not, I'm more of a YIMBY myself than a NIMBY, but with limits, of course. Uh, there's some uh, banter about, you know, the idea of potentially extending Pleasant Street to support some of the development that could happen up here. Not, I don't think so much the Habitat for Humanity project, but uh, I don't think any, to my knowledge, nobody's ruled it out completely. And um, we had a couple of email exchanges with the planning department, uh, Mike and, and, and uh, his staff and Meredith and the planning department. They gave some, some very well measured uh, responses. They weren't exactly the answers we're looking for, but I don't expect they can give us those answers. The answers we would have liked to hear is, um, yeah, no matter what, there's gonna be a nice forested buffer between uh, the surrounding neighborhoods and the new development. Um, and then the other one is, yeah, there's no way that anybody's gonna be able to extend Pleasant Street um, because of current regulations and so forth. So those are the answers we'd like to hear. And I understand that those are not really on the table. Um, so let me pose this question first, uh, which is regarding Act 250, um, what about the current zoning would trigger an Act 250 uh, hearing for development? And how does that compare to um, what might change if the zoning proposed zoning change would go through? I'll have a, another question for that after that. I'll try to go and answer that. So again, not, not the attorney. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so not the attorney, and um, but I will kind of give the best estimates. Uh, so Act 250 has a lot of triggers that can go into it, and it's there's some proposals in the State House that can change that as we speak. Um, but in general, it used to be that it was um, for Montpelier, because we have zoning and subdivision, it would be uh, 10, 10 units that would start to trigger Act 250, but then they uh, started to have 
uh, priority housing, which I believe is now 75 units. So if it is housing that is being provided for and qualifies as um, the for, for priority housing, it would be 75. Now, somewhere in there, there may be some other triggers and other requirements. Uh, I think it's a, a, a much more specific question um, that really, as with any proposal, it's really hard to, to comment on hypotheticals because we, we need to really know all the facts to know whether or not something is go, going to go in. But a few of the numbers um, generally are as low as uh, 10 units or 10 lots. I think it's 10 lots that can get you into um, Act 250 and it's 74 units that would uh, uh, for priority housing. So um, it's it's a little bit tricky to definitively answer that without knowing exactly what's being proposed. Thanks, Mike. And you have another question, Alan? Yeah, and just to clarify, just to make sure I understood the answer there, it, it sounds like that um, regardless of the zoning change, it's gonna be a similar set of things that are gonna trigger an Act 250 hearing. Yeah, sorry, I, sh I should have answered your second question as well. Uh, yeah, the change of zoning will have no impact on whether or not it's something that does or doesn't need Act 250. I believe it's the exact same trigger whether it's in rural or whether it's zoned residential 9,000. Okay, that's great. Um, and it sounds like it, you know, any significant project is gonna get us in there. That's, uh, ten, you, you know, talking about 10 units or more is uh, certainly beyond what we're concerned about. Um, so then let me, let me describe my uh, presumption about the, concept of extending Pleasant Street and what the current limitations might be. So, and then maybe I can get some correction or clarification on that. Um, in my experience, there's some set of regulations uh, around current stand, you know, standards that would be required of any new development in roadways. Um, whatever those may be, I'm not familiar, of course, with uh, the Montpelier one specifically, but um, Having lived up here, I, I have to imagine that um, Pleasant Street and the connecting, especially the connecting street, Cherry Street, are well below those standards for, you know, what would be allowed for a development of what's already here. Um, so, if I understand correctly, at least, uh, again, I'm not so sure if this is how it works in Montpelier, but any new development that would extend that street would bear some responsibility to not only handle the additional traffic load, but to bring the roads up to standards to handle the current traffic load as well. Is that, is that accurate? I guess I would say it's, um, we do have standards. Um, and I guess the, you know, the questions you were asking um, today you know, a little bit of my caution to, to, you know, not be able to come back and say it's impossible for somebody to extend Pleasant Street. You know, I, as I said, I think it's very difficult. I think it would be a challenge. But if I said somebody couldn't do it, I'm sure there's an engineer out there that would say challenge accepted. I'm going to go and show you how I can do this. And there um, road standards start to come in and apply when certain subdivisions reach reach certain sizes so somebody could put in a a a driveway and build a certain number of houses without qualifying as a road and therefore be able to build a certain number of units um, that's why i'm really cautious about going and saying it can't happen i know the the end of that road um, and i know the challenges that exist on cherry street um, which is why my comments earlier today to you really focused on if if I were a developer or if there was a developer who was looking to do a project on that 57 acre parcel, chances are good they're going to look in the same location that Habitat is looking because that is the area that's got the easiest access with the least steep slopes, access is a, a class uh, one town highway as opposed to accessing a class three highway, a uh, class three road, which is very narrow and steep. So, um, uh, uh, there are rules in place that would regulate uh, extending whether somebody tried to do a private road or a public road. Um, you know, if they went for a public road, you're right. There are a lot of engineering standards and it's going to be difficult and there's going to be a lot of dirt to move. And 
um, that decision process, that decision that would be made, would be made by the Development Review Board. Um, so that's out of the hands of, of the staff, the administration. So that's why I really can't say yes, it would, or yes, or and no, it wouldn't, because it's not a decision that staff is going to be making. Somebody can apply as hard as that proposal is to get approved. They can apply, and depending on the whims of the Development Review Board, it could get approved. But I don't see somebody extending that road to put in 50 units off of Pleasant Street. I think that would be my personal opinion. I think that would be a very difficult application for somebody to defend, but that's their application to defend. Um, and I guess I'll leave that <laughs> where it is, because I really, without an application, it's really hard to determine. I, I appreciate that completely, Mike. That, that's a wonderful response. And, and um, I understand I'm, I'm trying really hard to tease the answer I want out of out of you and the other folks here. Uh, and, and, I, and I know I'm not going to get there, but um, I just want to be clear that it, these are the, you know, Cherry Street, especially uh, Pleasant Street is tricky to drive. Cherry Street is downright treacherous. Um, there are, you know, like the real estate agents simply will not show houses up here in the wintertime because it is, it's, a, it's at their own risk, right? So um, I would think that even, you know, that the town's liability is limited by the fact that this, these roads have been here for so long and that if there were not significant upgrades to these roads for any new development, I, I would argue uh, that a single home being built past hours or off of Pleasant Street would um you know be being permitted to be built on these lots without major upgrades to these roads which would not just be dirt moving we're talking about blasting ledge to make the roads work up here to be wider you know it's sing it's basically single lane we have to we have to pull into each other's driveways to get out of each other's way on cherry street to get up and down cherry street and again that's a treacherous slope and uh there's an unspoken rule that the downhill traffic has priority because sometimes that's they, they can't stop. So um, I encourage anyone who isn't familiar to, uh, if you're feeling adventurous, to walk it. If you're feeling uh, uh, brave, drive it. If you're feeling uh, foolhardy, bike it. Um, and um, I guess so I have, I have another comment on um, the solar issue, but I think there's going to be opportunity to speak to that later. Is that accurate? Yes, there will be. Okay, I'll hold that for then and just, um, um, I guess if anybody could comment on what the town's liability is in approving development when there are, uh, you know, really life-threatening potential issues with the, the development that already exists. Okay. I'll leave it thank, at that. Thank you very much, Alan. I don't see any, oh, I do see uh, uh, Zach Watson uh, with his hand raised. Go ahead, Zach. Thank you, Councilor McCullough and, and the rest of the council. Um, and thank you, Alan, for your comments. Alan and I both moved up from the Upper Valley, so we're slowly taking over Central Vermont. Um, I'm Zach Watson. I'm the S Executive Director for uh, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity and just wanted to uh, first um, uh, let folks know that uh, Pleasant Street is uh, definitely not on our radar at, at all uh, as an option for um, for an access to the parcel. It's um, there are not many people as brave as those um, early uh, early developers that built that complex up on that hill. That is a steep hill, and I don't like driving it even when the roads are good. So that is absolutely not an option for us right now. Um, but I just wanted to speak generally about really why we're um, why we're exploring this parcel and why we really believe that this. Uh, the zoning change is a really good thing for the city, um, and it's really twofold. First of all, you know, there's, as we all know, there's not a lot of great parcels of land for uh, larger housing developments, and um, especially near the downtown from Montpelier. Uh, so this parcel is ideally located to the downtown, which is a major benefit for low-income families that we work with um, because they're able to have access to public transportation and services. So. Um, but in addition to that, just having a walkable community is both good for our, our community and also for the environment. Um, and by building developments closer to urban areas, uh, we're ultimately preventing forest fragmentation and parcelization in rural areas um, that don't have zoning. Um, and so ultimately, 
you know, we, we really do feel that regardless, uh, uh, and I'm uh, sorry, I'll just say that I know I've heard some folks say that we're afraid that another developer is going to come in and build this if Habitat doesn't. Um, and uh, I have a lot of things to say to that, but regardless of whether this is a Habitat project, this is an ideal parcel for housing if it can be developed and it should be developed for housing in Montpelier. So it benefits that way. The, and then the final piece is just that currently there is a lack of um, parks on uh, this side of uh, the, on this side of the river. And uh, well, we're really happy that the private, the owner of this property is willing to let the abutters walk on it at their own leisure. It is not currently a publicly accessible parcel of land. It is not a public park. Um, and if we truly want to create green space on this side of the river, which benefits the entire city, we need to put this into uh, an easement. Um, so we're protecting the land and that is our goal. Um, and there's way too many steep parts of this parcel to actually be developed. So um, really, I think this, this rezoning, um, making it possible to do this development is, uh, is really going to benefit the city in, in, in both for housing and also for uh, green space. So uh, that's that's my positive things to say about this. And thank you for considering our rezoning request. And I'm happy Peter didn't cry the whole time. That was good. Thank, thank you, Zach and Peter. Um, is there anyone in the room? Yes, uh, Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Thomas Weiss again. Um, moving 102 Northfield Street out of the rural district will not comply with the master plan. The notice for this hearing incorrectly states that the unified development regulations have been developed to implement the, the policies of the Montpelier master plan. And rezoning the portion of 102 Northfield Street that is in the rural district will not be in compliance with the plan. The plan has a future land use map, which shows that most of this parcel to be in the rural district. This portion is not in the growth center, it's not in the smart growth district, nor is it designated to be studied for smart growth additions. Therefore, rezoning it for denser development is not in compliance with the future land use portion of the master plan. The master plan also states that development should reinforce existing neighborhoods by increasing diversity of use and by increasing current densities within the growth center and reducing them outside of the growth center. As I mentioned, the parcel is not in the growth center, thus converting the parcel to a denser residential 9,000 district is contrary to this strategy. The master plan also states, the goal of the rural district will be to encourage traditional rural uses and to maintain the natural resource base of the city. Agricultural activities, forestry, and low density settlement patterns, including uh, rural economic activities will be encouraged. New housing developments that have an impact on target resources will need to consider minimizing the land impact through clustering and transfer of development rights, maintaining biodiversity and wildlife habitat, and protecting valuable agricultural and forest resources. Thus, converting the parcel to residential 9000 is contrary again to the future land use designation. The master plan should be upheld by working within the existing zoning. The three acres now in residential 9,000 can have 14 dwelling units. The 53 and 8 tenths acres now in the rural district can have 26 units. There are already 11 units on the parcel. That means an additional 29 units may be built using the standard densities. The parcel is also eligible for cottage cluster development. That allows a doubling of the density, means a total of 80 units. The parcel, as I said, already has 11, so 69 new units may be built without changing the density, I'm sorry, the district of the parcel. And if you want to change the district that the parcel is in, I believe you really need to go back 
and have the planning commission amend the master plan. The, the planning commission, it seems, has spent a lot of time over the last many number of years on zoning changes and really has done nothing on the master plan probably for 10 or a dozen years. Master plans now have to be uh, revised at least every eight years, but the last revision was really a very minimal change in order to get the 2017, 2018 zoning amendments put into place because they needed to have the master plan updated. So uh, I request that the city council reject this proposed amendment, and it seems that there is also adequate room on the site for an ample number of dwelling units. And those are my comments on number two, and I'll be back for another one. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do you have some anything you want to say about the master plan issue, or you want to hold it for next time? Um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can hold them to next time to to kind of look. There's a there are a number of things that have changed over time, including where the growth center is, um, and it's also a guiding document. So we have to kind of take it in context with all of the the aspects of it. But I can certainly go through and review what's in there and come back next time with a with an answer to that. Okay, thanks. Is there anyone else in the room who wants to make a comment or has a question about uh, proposal number three? And nobody else on online. I think Alan Johnson, your hand is probably just still up from before. before. No, okay. I was uh, hoping to add in one more comment if, it, if it's acceptable. I don't want to drag okay. it on though. If, you're if, if, it's on. Very, if it's very quick. Uh, yeah, just to, in support, um, you know, in, in honor, in Mike, Mike's concerns, you know, I, I agree completely. We must always remember to never use words like always and never, right? <laughs> Especially when it comes to public policy. Um, but just to clarify, you know, um, you know, as Zach's comments, again, we, I, I support the efforts in his project. Um, and, you know, people like him and reasonable people would look at the slopes that are marked off in red on his project proposal as unbuildable and think, hey, nobody would build there. But I sit in a house that, you know, is counter to that. <laughs> Where every house on this side of the street and Cherry Street is on a slope that is, you know, quote unbuildable, and they're all square and true, and they were built in, the, you know, this one was built in the late 1800s, 1890s. Um, so it's doable, uh, but I think the the question comes down to at what cost and um, at what impact. So uh, just getting a better sense of, you know. I think for people that are concerned, getting a better sense of what the costs for an individual to build homes. You know, I'm not worried about what Zach's looking to do, but I am concerned about people trying to build additional homes off the end of Pleasant Street, potentially as, you know, ways to reduce to, to you know, selling, selling lots there, right, uh, as a way to offset the costs of the, the uh, a project like what Habitat might do. Um, those kinds of developments are I think counter to everybody's interests, uh, both new development and existing homeowners, unless there's a massive restructuring of the streets, which is an insurmountable task without buying up most of the properties and either knocking some down or um, sitting on them while the road is being developed and selling them again afterwards. So is that, you know, the, that's the kind of scale of, of effort that's running through my mind. And I, I guess the question is how, close am I to reality there? <laughs> or, or, or is it much easier than I'm imagining? Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I, I think I think that's all the comments I'm seeing now on uh, item number three. That being the case, I'll uh, turn the chair over to the mayor. Okay, so normally uh, the council takes a break at 830 and we are uh, more than 15 minutes beyond that. So we are going to um, take up number four, which I believe is um, uh, setbacks in residential nine. Uh, so we're going to take a, a 10 minute break. We'll be back um, coming back from our break. And so we are um, 
Going to start back up with residential 9,000 side setback comments. Anyone have in person have, oh, actually, before we get started, I do want to mention um, just a couple protocols here. One, do try to keep your comments to two minutes. And uh, the, this time is not designed to be a back and forth. Um, so if you have comments, try to um, put them all together into um, uh, your, your two minutes. And then uh, we may, if there's questions in them, we may address them after that. Um, OK, so having said that, uh, comments on Residential 9000, anyone in person? Okay, I am not seeing anyone, and I am um, having to rejoin the Zoom. Does anyone see commenters? I don't see anyone on Zoom. Okay. All right. So, hang on one second. Okay, so uh, that means that we are up to number five, the rail setbacks in the Eastern Gateway District. Any comments in person on that? Okay, I'm not seeing any. And uh, no one online as, as far as I can see. So we're gonna move on then to number seven. And since seven has um, at least had the um, uh, the comments did pertain to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, skip, I skipped six. Um, thank you. Sorry, six. Six is um, uh, the new planned unit development rules. Any comments in person on the new planned de unit development rules? Okay, and online, not seeing any. Okay, so. Um, all right, we're going to go back to seven then. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jack for this one. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number seven in the city's proposal is a removal of requirements to use new neighborhood and conservation planned unit developments. Um, I see uh, one hand in the uh, on the queue. I'm going to see if there's anyone in, uh, in the building who wants to speak on this item first. I do not see any. Uh, call on Zach Watson. Uh, thanks again. Um, and I just wanted to um, comment on the uh, alternative option that was put forward. Um, I just would like to say that I'm not really sure why number three was connected to number seven. Um, it's actually kind of baffling to me. Uh, I sat in all the DRB meetings and there was definitely a discussion of how could eliminating the PUD rules impact the habitat project, but there was never a discussion about, well, if we get rid of this, we should leave habitat in rural. So this seems to have come up after the public meetings and I'm not really sure where it came from. Um, but I do wanna clarify that if, if the project stays in rural, the current allowable density for the 50 acres is 25 units and, and I know the previous speaker talked about cluster, uh, cottage clusters. Um, for folks that are not familiar with this, this is, these are single family households. Um, and, and that would allow for us to double the capacity. It would be 50 single family households, um, which is absolutely 100% not feasible on that parcel. So if, if, you, if, the, if the rezoning isn't allowed for, that parcel, it will effectively kill any opportunity for housing on that parcel. Um, so I just want to make that clear. There's, we're not going to be able to build 80 households up there. I'm not sure where that number came from. Um, and, and, that, and also that number seven is completely disconnected to number three. I'm not sure how that happened. So <laughs> just want to clarify. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Anyone else online? I don't see anyone else online. Anyone in the room? Nobody. So we're done with item seven and turn the chair back over to the mayor. Okay, and I'm sure a lot of you are here for number eight. Um, so 
And we're up to number eight, then removal of uh, the residential density requirements from Riverfront and Res 1500 districts. Uh, who would like to speak uh, who is here in person? Uh, if you would uh, just come up to the mic and form a, a queue, then uh, we'll, we'll go in that order. Hi. I really apologize that I don't have a baby on my knee. I wish I did. <laughs> um, so my name is Courtney O'Connor and I live on Loomis Street. Um, I'm relatively new to Montpelier. Um, I moved here in 2019 before the pandemic and I purchased a home in um, 2020. And I'm asthmatic, so forgive me, I have to take this off. Um, I didn't know when I purchased my home that I was walking into a difference of opinion, shall we say, that apparently had been in existence for nine years in our neighborhood amongst various neighbors. And that difference of opinion, in part from the extensive uh, examination of it that I've had to do to protect my home and my investment, um, stems in part from what I, as a newbie to Montpelier, but often newbies bring fresh and helpful perspectives to problems. Um, what I perceive as a confusion and conflation between a design review overlay district and a historic district of which Montpelier on it, the surface and to the public is very, very proud, the historic district, but in reality and in the regulations, it's very confusing. So um, I, uh, I would like to support um, Mike um, his um, reticence about moving forward with the change in residential 1500 before design, if you want to use those terms, design standards have been clarified. And I would urge um, the city to do its best to dispense with this conflation and confusion that exists on the record and in the practice of the DRB between design review a historic district and that when the city does that it recalls that it is obliged to implement and to respect state law okay and that is extremely important when it comes to the preservation of historic districts and structures in um in montpelier and everywhere in the united states um so thank you very much for really um clarifying presentation and I support um, the staff's position on that. Um, and then I do have a comment on number nine, so I'll go sit down until then. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Sue Walbridge again, corner of Wild Air Mont Senior Crosby Avenue for 67 of my 69 years in my historic home. Um, I'm very concerned about this, and as I told the city manager, what I'm, I'm not going to get into all these weeds that we have here of policies and stuff. I am going to speak as a lifelong person who has lived in the city, which I bet most of you haven't. Um, I am seeing an eating away of Montpelier. Montpelier has been a gem. Um, I worked for the tourism division for the state for many years, and I got to deal with all these tourists that would come in, and they loved Montpelier because it was so small, and it's the smallest capital in the USA, which it won't be if we start doing all this density of people coming in. Um, and it just, you know, they said it was like a movie set when they went downtown because it was just left with this quality and and the historic part of it was very appealing to many people and the great thing was they'd come in and they would spend their money and then they would leave but now we just i told mr frazier the signage down you know on bailey avenue has caused people to come in and they don't know where the welcome center and so they just leave i was working in a building right on the corner of bailey avenue um and these people would come in and drive and they go and then they would leave. They wouldn't even come into downtown Montpelier or anything. But the buildings, you know, a prime thing is most of you probably don't know what the original post office looked like. It was like a castle, a beautiful thing. And that got destroyed and the monstrosity that we have today sits there. 
and it sticks out like a sore thumb. And this is what's going to happen. What is this they, that they can come in if this goes through and like take my house down, some developer, and then put up a three story flat roof thing? I, I can't believe you're even thinking of doing this to people. You know, my home, I can't believe that just this thing that, you know, coming in and just taking over and doing these kind of drastic changes. And on those of natives, we never seem to get, nobody asks us about anything or how things were or how they came about. My dad was born in a house on College Street before that became a wealthy street. Um, but we're eating, I battled cancer last year and I'm gonna compare this now. What I'm seeing now and what this planning commission is thinking of doing is like a cancer to Montpelier. It's going to be invading Montpelier slowly and just chewing it up and changing its whole way and how, you know, why people wanted to come here. Uh, please don't do this. You're just moving so fast and many of you haven't even been here for number of years and the ones that i know after about five years they move away again and then we're stuck with whatever decisions that you made like this so please from a native standpoint think from that not just all these little rules and you know things of the commissions think about people from your heart and what it would be like for you to have somebody come in and destroy the city that you have lived in your entire year thank you and this is only the second time in my entire life I have spoken in front of city council. And I'm speaking for a lot of people. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, I'm Catherine Gordon and I live on Brown Street, which is a very small street. And um, I just wanted to say I really think you should think hard about this 1500 proposal um, because there's really issue with parking and there's an issue with space already and to take out um, the controls around that is just setting us up for more disaster i feel and also i feel penalized because my house was also a house that became on the historical thing so i'm going to be confined by that not that i would ever do anything to um you know harm the beauty of my house because that's part of why i bought it but um it puts constraints on that but then allows people around me to do whatever they feel is in their best interest that's it thanks thank you Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Am I on there? Okay. <laughs> it's Sandy Vitz, too. I live at 14 Loomis Street. And um, I want to preface my comments by being really glad that Jack asked for the CNU report. The CNU is the Congress for New Urbanism. Everyone may know that already. And they are a national think tank of planners and um, they were invited by the AARP to try to find what are the barriers against building more housing in Montpelier. And this report actually came out, but by a glitch didn't get into Montpelier's hands until about a month ago. And I really hope that I, it's too long for me to make copies for everybody, but I really hope that you'll take the time to read it because we're referring to it all the time tonight and it's kind of hard not to know what the heck we're talking about and i really like jack's idea of putting it as a link online because a lot of people have been asking me about it so i'm going to really try hard two minutes because i know i've gone over before um uh i am referring mostly to the commission's memo and um our, my biggest comments on it um, have actually been grouped together with a bunch of other people we've been talking. And Janet, my neighbor, is going to present that next. So I am going to 
use my time to talk about just a couple of things that I need to, I feel like I need to focus on. The commission's memo implied that I was the only commentator on this topic. Uh, first of all, that's just not true. At least two other people um, commented in the two hearings that the planning commission held. And um, actually that is phenomenal compared when you begin to think about how little this topic has been shared with the public. There's been nothing in the Argus that I'm aware of, nothing in the bridge until I wrote on March 9th. Um, the only letter that was sent out to the entire district was a letter to landowners. And after putting flyers in every single mailbox I could find on Sunday, um, I can tell you that I think 85% of the buildings in our district are already apartment buildings, and many of them have three, four, or five apartments. So you probably reached at most 25% of the population by sending out a letter to landowners. The letter came out on the Friday before Thanksgiving, and the meeting was the Monday after Thanksgiving, and the entire item was, it was sunk in the in the bottom of the you know number eight and it was two sentences long with no explanation no graphics i mean it was really easy to miss so every single person i asked who is a landowner if they had seen it they all said no so nobody looked at it nobody knew i would not have known unless barbara connery happened to see me and talk about it so if that one conversation hadn't happened, there would be no input to you tonight. I, I really wouldn't like, I'd like that to sink in at how important it is to have public comment. And the sooner in the process, the better. I think it's more constructive, more friendly, um, when it's early, not in the two minute limit as testimony in, in a hearing. I wanted to say that a long time ago, um, when I first started uh, participating as an adult in this kind of thing in Montpelier, there was a real encouragement of the public to get involved early because the hearing process was actually pretty quick because everyone had talked themselves out already. And I kind of like that. I think it'd be better use of your time too. Okay, so um, I wanna also point out that I was um, disparaged in that summary as a generally negative person i think most people who know me know that i love montpelier i'm devoted to montpelier and um i am a totally pro housing i know there's a problem so i don't know how i would have been taken as negative i was making constructive comments to someone who's defending them that might feel like it's negative but my that was not my intention i my intention is to try to make our ordinance as good as it can be I was also kind of offended to be dismissed as a, lo a local architect. Um, I studied planning and design at one of the best universities for that in the whole country. I studied under the professors who wrote the textbooks for the rest of the country. I taught university level design for more than 10 years, including at the University of Notre Dame. I wrote in codes, written codes for other communities. I had a design institute when I taught at Norwich. I served on Montpelier's Design Review Committee for many years. When I grew up, we were taught not to toot our own horns, no bragging. And I'm, I'm embarrassed that I have to do that tonight to explain to you why that statement was, I think, incorrect. Um, okay, so super quickly, um, I need to point out to you that um, this is from talking to a member of the CNU um, that they did not complement our zoning ordinance as progressive. They complemented our master plan as progressive, which is fantastic considering it's over 12 years old, really out of date. I think in the conversations I've gotten tonight is the general feeling that it's kind of irrelevant is probably because the people who are really active in town now haven't been personally associated with updating it. I'm so excited that maybe we will be able to do that. I've been thinking tonight about the things that have, that are out of date, they're huge. We've had a food crisis with COVID. We've had climate changes significantly different in 12 years. And the housing situation is significantly different in the last 12 years. 
So, and, and think about the change of ownership in the last 12 years of Montpelier. It's, it's huge as people have left and new ones have come in, which is healthy, but anyways, that's why it should be a living document. That's what statue wants it to be. All right, and then very quickly, um, I, I'm glad you prefaced some of the comments because um, tonight with your own questions, um, first of all, uh, design review has been, um, uh, sorry, let, let's say the, the, the idea of this character of a neighborhood as being um, subjective is actually not true. In my profession, we try to boil it down as much as we can to measurable things and think about it. Any reasonable person walking down the street can ass assess the character of a neighborhood. That's why so many tourists like to come to Montpelier because they say, gosh darn, this is a great neighborhood. So what are the things? The width of the street, the approximate massing of the houses as they face the street, their depth, the regularity of pattern. We have big house, little house, back house, barn. That is so common in Montpelier. The size of the trees, the slope, the percentage slope of the roof, the shape of the windows. These are all things that what the CNU does is they try to advise new communities. They make design guidelines that try to distill that, that's code. So, you know, a building should be, most buildings are 25 feet wide. They should be somewhere between 25 and 30 feet wide, whatever. And that's one example. If most of the roofs are 10 and 12, say they should need to be between eight and 12 and 12 and 12. They're very specific but they, they're a list of rules rather than the kind of ordinance that we have now. I agree we need to shift away towards this, but you can't shift one part at a time. It just doesn't work. So when people were against design review in the past, I wanna give the example of Dave Bellini, who I hope he's here tonight listening. His, he just had a death in this family, so he's not physically here. Um, he was against design review for our street, even though most of our street is in the historic district. So there's no review for our house. And he was against this. The reason why is because there were density limits in place. People couldn't tear down properties on our street. So now I need to address that, which is, um, I've heard several times from the planning commission at those hearings and then tonight from Mike. Um, and Mike, I totally respect, he is a planner and thank you for, for um, your guidance on this issue too. Um, oh my gosh, I forgot what I was gonna say. Um, that, just so you know, Sandy, you're at 10 minutes. Oh my God. I know, okay. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I didn't yeah, want to interrupt I'm you. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's I'm okay. So sorry. It's okay. You know, I, I, I really didn't want to interrupt you. But. You can take one and pass. You can then take one and then pass. Okay. I need to read this. So, so I just very quickly in my construction hat, I've been in construction for 40 years um, and I have done developments in Michigan. I was an equity partner in development, so I do understand development. Um, I keep hearing that this not going to happen. This isn't going to happen. So what are we worried about? Folks, this is going to happen. And in my neighborhood, if there were one or two teardowns built out with full build outs for apartment buildings, it would disfigure my street. It only takes one or two. We can't even once we we open the door to this, we can't take it back. I have heard from lawyers because of possible uh, the city could encounter lawsuits if they're already in the pipe work and then we take it away. So I just want to show you quickly. So I don't know where how far it went. Um, So I used my house as an example. It actually, you can tell from the site plan that it's not a full build out on the property. We were just going, Catherine and I were just going over the math. She owns a fifth of an acre. Um, she could have the same build out would, would, would threaten her property. 
um, even I think even smaller, you could build a full 2,500 footprint building on it. So this is what it looks like doing my, I, I didn't f think it was fair to, to, to draw on top of someone else's house. So my house currently has three units. I, I don't have the math now, so it earns, um, it earns, I have two apartments. I earn $50,000 a year income, not really, because I live in one of them. Um, the market value of my house is right now about 540 compared to, says Zillow. So that is actually, I'm at the considered the buildable ratio of annual income to the value of the basis of the property. Does that make sense? One to 100. If I were to follow the current rules, I could actually build eight units, but I probably wouldn't because I wouldn't hit that one to 100 ratio. If someone were to buy my property at market value and tear it down and then do a build, full build out, they would, if they didn't want to come to, you, to DRB at all, if they just wanted a permit, they could build this little rectangle I drew on my property and they could build this thing and um, they'd have plenty in the room for parking, although it's not even required. Parking's not required in our district at all, which is crazy because they'd be adding 30 cars to the street if they didn't feel like building parking. With a PUD or some other special permission, they could actually build twice as much on this because the, the dash lines on this are the, the building setbacks. So you can see that in the math, and I was super conservative here, um, residential construction starts at $450 a square foot right now. So 300 is super low. And I'm assuming they would use modular construction, which would be super ugly for my neighbors. But they could make a full profit. And why would they do this? Because they would have a lot of income as they depreciated the building over 27 years. Why would you have income for three or four units when you could have the income for 20 units? So, and, and with a house that's worth 300,000 or 250 over on Franklin Street, the smaller houses are actually even more vulnerable than my house because my house happens to be big already. So this, and I, I should got to remember that the developer's primary question is, once they've done this math, is how quickly will the market absorb those units? And right now we know that they would be absorbed immediately. Most units are getting purchased or spoken for reserved before they're even built. So there, there's nothing that would stop someone from doing this, especially the projects, the properties that are not in design review district. And I think it's a half or at least a half of the properties are not in the design review district. Okay, my time is up. Um, this woman, Devora, um, said she sent put this note in my mailbox at five o'clock today, and she said that she has neither a phone nor a computer to allow her to contact her council members. She says, please do not change the zoning rules without a pu public discussion of a total city plan. So I'm going to circulate that. I'm also going to circulate the article. I want to make sure everybody saw the article that I wrote in the bridge. Did you all get the letter from Diane McCario? Did all of you get it? I don't to save think so. you time, I'm not going to read it out loud. But Diane um, wrote an elegant letter. Um, I'm, I'm just going to have to keep passing these on. And then did you get all get the letter from Larry Myers? On yeah, I think you can just assume that go ahead and pass it all. Okay. Out. Well, I, I want these people asked me specifically to tell you their names, and they actually wanted me to read the letters, but because I've taken up so much time, I won't. Thank you. So Lawrence Myers of Meyer of Loomis Street, Diane McCarrier of Loomis, and this is Dr. John Peterson, who I'm sure most of you know, um, on St. Paul Street. I think we got all of those. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Thank I you. really appreciate you so much. No thank problem. you. Thank you. And do you want the color cards used? Oh, um, no, no, that's okay. Just, uh, yeah, okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Janet Wormser. I live on Loomis Street across from Sandy, and I was just going to read this letter that Sandy wrote. Um, it was signed by 27 people, um, including Diane and Larry, who wrote letters that have been circulated. Dear Mayor and City Council members, we write in response to the Planning Commission's memo of February 28, 2022, regarding 11 amendments they proposed to Montpelier zoning regulations. We take strong issue with the Planning Commission's statements regarding item number eight, removal of residential density requirements from riverfront and residential 1500 districts districts, we urge you to reject this amendment. While there are other inaccuracies in the Commission's introductory background assessments for item number eight, we want to make sure that the City Council is aware that the Planning Commission misquoted the key CN CNUAARP report on Montpelier zoning regulation several times. The effect is significant, and we are aware that the CNU did not intend the report to be interpreted this way. Most importantly, the CNU emphasized Montpelier's master plan should be followed, quote, encourage a moderate increase in residential density through compatible infill and through conversion of some existing buildings into multiple units. Development should reinforce existing neighborhoods to ensure that the historic character and appeal of neighborhoods are protected. The CNU then recommends three changes to Montpelier's ordinance, all to be made one at a time. That's emphasized. Encourage a moderate increase in residential density in certain areas. This increase would be accomplished through compatible infill through conversion of some existing buildings to multiple units. Number two, adopt design standards for additional residential units. Clear standards to truly ensure that the historic character and appeal of neighborhoods are protected, ensuring that a new building, re a, a new building remains at the approximate scale of a larger family, single family home. Montpelier might include standards for front porch, roof slopes, et cetera. Clarify processes for incrementally adding residential units. That's the third one. The CNU report clearly states that number one should not be enacted without number two and number three. According to the CNU, our existing regulations are not sophisticated enough to ensure that the historic character and appeal of existing neighborhoods will be protected without number two and number three. In plain language, without compensatory adjustments, just removing density limits will encourage teardowns and large apartment building construction. This caution has been repeated by Montpelier's planning director, Mike Miller, and by planning commissioner member, Bob, Barbara Conry, who is the only architect on the commission and who resigned over this controversy. Noting that, noting that a large portion of the R1500 district is on the design review district, we are concerned that neither the design review committee nor the historic preservation commission was consulted about this change to the ordinance. We strongly suggest that all three of the CNU recommendations be considered together. That would be the best solution. If in the interest of time this is not possible, the design review district should immediately be expanded to encompass the entire riverfront and the R1500 districts. This would be a minimal protection to ensure that Montpelier's historic character and owner-occupied apartment buildings are preserved. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess, okay. Hello, um, I'm Bob McCullough and I live on Bailey Avenue and I will try to articul articulate a position for the Historic Preservation Commission, of which I'm a member. Um, when, when competing values, all of which are important, uh, a 
affordable housing, uh, preventing sprawl, encouraging downtown growth, protecting historic neighborhoods, preventing forest fragmentation. When those values compete, finding solutions is so very, very difficult. Often answers, the best answers are found in good, thoughtful, skillful architectural and urban design. And to move forward with a major transformation of Montpelier's zoning as proposed without careful design standards, I think be so very, very risky. And to underscore that, I will add that the Historic Preservation Commission just recently developed new standards that are now, that are now being implemented. And I can say that <clears throat> as careful as those standards are, they weren't directed at the very precise type of problem that will be developed or that will occur with increased pressure for infill as a result of increased density. They will help, but they weren't specifically designed for that. And the guidelines that we are in the process of developing now also are not geared specifically for that objective. Toward that end, or toward, toward a solution, looking toward a solution, European cities, Sweden, and in particular Stockholm, have really looked at this issue of finding ways to increase density, urban density, finding ways to provide affordable housing without compromising historic districts, historic neighborhoods, without losing open space, uh, are really more advanced than we are. And I think this is an opportunity to do it right. Montpelier is such a special place. Why don't we uh, pause and take a look at what other cities have done, perhaps hiring a consultant and investigating the topic uh, in a more thorough way. That, that was my recommendation for a solution. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else in person wish to come in on this? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone, so I'm going to go to um, folks who are with us digitally. So I'm going to go in the order that you are appearing on my screen. So we're going to start with um, Kirby Keaton, then go to Joe Castellano, and then Barbara Conray. Go ahead, Kirby. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, in case you don't know, I'm the chair of the Popular Planning Commission. I'm chiming in because uh, Mike has a slightly different recommendation for number eight than the Planning Commission voted out. The, the Planning Commission did unanimously vote out this suggestion that's before you, just so you know. Um, so, so I felt like I should address this. It's slightly different than, than um, Mike's view, although usually I'm thrilled to have Mike uh, speak for us because it's, he does a phenomenal job. Um, I also want to thank all of you because I know how thankless service work can be. So, so <laughs> it's, it's, I see it's 935. So, so thank you. You're appreciated. Um, the way that this proposal came about was there were two big things. One is that the planning commission was aware that the planning experts around the country, the think tanks, the research that's been done are all in agreement that the old paradigm of having density caps doesn't work. Like that's, and if you, when you do see the CNU report that's been talked about, you'll see that the CNU is adamant about it. No, number one on the list is get rid of your density caps, which is, so for this proposal, we're talking about the two neighborhoods that have the highest density right now that, that have density caps and just getting rid of those as, as an incremental small change. Um, so so that's that's where this started with was this is what we need to do this is the direction of things this is the direction of good planning um and the reason for that the number two reason is that i know that we need to have a conversation about this and i think you can tell from your comments tonight that we really need to have a conversation about what density means and so um i'm sorry that that you're we're, there, it seems like there's a lot of drama here but um I kind of knew that when we proposed it because we need to have this conversation. The reason why all of the think tanks and everyone like says, says what they say and the reason why CNU is saying that Montpelier needs to drop its um, density caps, not just in the two neighborhoods we're talking about, they're talking about everywhere basically. Um, the reason for that is, is it's, it's kind of common sense. Um, 
density is a regulation of how many people can live in your neighborhood. How many people? And our values right now are we want housing, we want people, we know there's a great need. Um, we want lots of people. We want more people. Like, I think that that's a shared value um, across our city and with the city council. So the, so the density caps only serve, the only thing they directly regulate is something that goes against our values. It's, it's in the way. As far as how our neighborhoods look, it's, we do have design review, but I want to make the point because I think this was kind of confused tonight a little bit. We also have a lot of other zoning bylaws that regulate how things look other than design review. We don't necessarily need design review everywhere. That's not necessarily the answer. We don't necessarily, you know, we we can always go back to our zoning bylaws and try to improve them to, to determine what's going to make our communities look good. But I tell you, density doesn't do that. Density has never, ever been designed to do that. That's not what it, it's intended to do. It's intended to regulate how many people can live there. And we want more people to live here. And all, and all of the like, planning brains around the country are saying, this is unhelpful. This is good, not good for you. Get rid of it. Um, so I want to have this conversation because my experience on the planning commission is that whenever a zoning change comes up and there's a talk about a change in density and you saw it all tonight, people get really upset and they talk about how their community is going to look so much worse and getting through to people that that's not what density is supposed to do. And that's not what density does in reality is the conversation that we hope to have. It's a, it's a paradigm change. Like this, this issue we're talking about is related to a paradigm change, making us see things differently. When Mike gave his presentation tonight, he talked about how our zoning neighborhoods are named after the density number they're associated with. Um, we should change that because that's not helpful. It's not helpful that we always think in terms of density when what we really care about is how things look. If, if we were obsessed with density, we would be obsessed with keeping people out. Like that's not what we're obsessed with, right? It's not helpful. So, so I'm happy to have this conversation and I'm glad we're having this conversation. I might've been a little naive going into it, thinking that if we just talk about this and explain what things really mean, then it will get better. Um, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it will in the long run. And, and that's what I'm still def definitely hoping. Um, but that's where we're coming from. So, our, our, so our, where we where we disagree with Mike is Mike wants to wait and line up the design review um, with any changes we make to uh, removing density caps. We uh, recognize the all the, all of the planning commission recognizes that uh, there's no need to wait because these density caps aren't doing anything to help how our neighborhoods look. That's not not what they're doing. So why do we need to change design review? Because that's not actually related to what these things do. I know everyone, and I, I think some of you, maybe your minds are being blown by what I'm saying right now, because it's like everyone who talks about this acts like density is related to how your neighborhood looks, and it's not. And, you know, so that's like, we want to change this over time. I know that tonight, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to change any minds, but I'm hoping in the long run, if we get away from the D word, and we start focusing on um, the parts of our zoning bylaws that are actually dedicated to how our neighborhoods look and concentrate on those things, that that's going to be really constructive. And, and hopefully in the long run, we don't have density caps because um, all the planning brains out there know that this is not, it's not helpful and it's, and it's hurting housing. And we don't know how much it's hurting housing. It's hard to, to measure these things. We can't measure it, but um, so, so I think I'll leave it at that. I hope, um, I addressed uh, enough things and I am on standby if anyone's interested in asking about, you know, how does the planning commission feel about this as opposed to the, you know, the planning staff. Thank you. All right, Joe Castellano. Yes, thank you. I'll lower my hand. Um, thank you so much. And I want to thank everybody for their patience tonight. I'm sure that a number of you have already seen a copy of a draft letter that I submitted to Ann Watson and Jack, a couple of the supervisors, Connor Casey and Donna. Um, I'm against this proposed change because I think that they're proposing 
uh, eliminating the density requirements without looking at some of the other recommendations of that new urbanism uh, CNU report. So I would suggest that we actually focus on the recommendations of that report as a whole, as opposed to just cherry picking one little piece. Um, and the other thing too, is I, I've done a little bit of research about what Kirby Keaton is uh, a big proponent of in reducing or eliminating density uh, limits. And so far, the biggest city that I've seen in the US that has eliminated this has been Minneapolis. And as far as I can tell in the four or five years since they've eliminated it, it sort of had mixed results. They haven't gotten the sort of density that they were hoping for. So I'm hoping that as a result of doing this, or as we start moving down this path, at least we see, okay, what's the intended consequence or what do we hope to achieve with this? That was essentially my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, go ahead. Yes, um, thanks Planning Commission for uh, bringing this to the fore. I think one of the things that it's done is, is kind of encouraged this community discussion, but thanks for to the council for taking a serious uh, look at this. Um, I'm a retired architect. I'm very strongly in favor of sensitive new housing and I'm actually working on, on creating more housing in Montpelier. Um, I also did serve on the planning commission until October um, when, and I know when the zoning was written, um, because I was part of that and we took a lot of very careful look at how we set these particular density limits. So I know a lot of consideration was used. However, when the planning commission decided to go forward with this kind of blanket elimination of density, um, within just a first zone and later would, would move it to other districts, I really felt like I could not support that. Um, as an architect, I've used zoning ordinances. I've worked with developers. I know what they want. And what they would like to do is to put as many units on a piece of property as possible. And the easiest way to do that on some of our larger properties in Montpelier, including in Res 1500, is to tear down the existing buildings. Now, previously, when the zoning went through, there was a lot of concern about that happening. And what I could, in good faith, say at that time was that we had the guardrails set up so that that would not happen. And one of those guardrails was the density limit that we incorporated. And I know that planners don't like to use the word density. Um, because it, it's not actually defining the number of people. In fact, it's defining the number of households that we necessarily allow on a piece of property. Um, but it will certainly drive the character if we no longer have any limits and developers could easily come in and follow every one of the other requirements that is in place in Res 1500 and more than double the allowable units, never mind the number of units that are actually there. And I did send to the Planning Commission um, some example, just example properties, because that's what architects do, is when we work with developers, we define how many, what's the potential of this property, what could possibly happen. And I'm really concerned also that this is just the first step and what they want to do is to expand this to all, all, um, all districts. And it's because we have a number of large lots, um, it's, it's very concer concerning to me. Um, and I think that we need to really not only be concerned about design standards, because we do have to some limited degree, we do have design standards, but what we don't have is a prohibition of to tearing down the historic buildings if they are out, if the property is outside the historic district. And that's really um, a concern because if somebody wanted to maximize the number of units on a piece of property, the best way to do it would be to remove the buildings that are there. Um, and I, I think that it's, it's, uh, it does in fact, density does affect the character of the neighborhood significantly. Um, because if, in that case, because it's going to 
remove our historic fabric, even for the buildings that are not in the historic district. Um, so I would urge you to turn this down and, and uh, do further consideration, take a, a stronger look at what, what we can do to maximize the use of our existing buildings, maximize the potentials for infill between our existing buildings or within them. Um, and so that we can really retain the character of our neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else uh, online. Oh, uh, right, okay. So, um, oh, okay, I, Eric Gilbertson, go ahead. Uh, Eric, you are muted. And Mayor, I'm still waiting to. Okay. There, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm Eric Gilbertson. I'm, I live on Richardson Street in Montpelier. I am the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission and vice chair of the Design Review Committee. Uh, I, I uh, would urge the council not to approve this, uh, this zoning change for, for a couple of reasons. One is that it, it's pretty clear what several people have said is uh, uh, historic preservation may be an unintended consequence of the density regulations at this point. So if we remove the density regulations, we need to have in place some regulations, uh, either through design review that uh, protect our neighborhoods. Uh, the, uh, now with the density, it's, it's probably more difficult to add units. And I, things you could do to an existing historic building to add units, you could change the roof line, uh, which is, it defines the character of buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, so, and this is happening all over the country where uh, when property gets so valuable, uh, developers buy up lots and either replace a small building with a larger McMansion or uh, with a, a, a number of units. So I, I think it is a real risk for Montpelier as our property values go up. Uh, and I, I think that uh, expanding the design review district and the Preservation Commission, is a, as you guys know, uh, drafted uh, regulations. And I think maybe we should go back and take a look at them and see how they might apply in these conditions and expand the design review. Now, people don't like regulation in general. I've known that for years. But I think if we're going to protect those qualities of our city that we all enjoy, uh, we need to look at regulations to do that. Um, I, I, I've submitted a writ, some written summary of my testimony. Uh, the other thing I would urge uh, is that uh, the planning commissioner, the city council, or the planning uh, uh, department really use the people on both design review and the historic preservation commission as they're developing these uh, uh, regulations and guidelines to protect our neighborhoods. Uh, we're there, the city council appoints people uh, for their establishes these committees and appoints people to them. So that would be my recommendation is that these committees be used early in the planning process. And I found out about all of this uh, sort of incidentally. So I, I uh, uh, certainly appreciate Barbara's comments. Uh, and I think we do run some real risk in the city of, uh, of uh, tearing down historic buildings to increase our density. If we just look at density, we need to look at the other qualities of our neighborhoods and make sure we protect them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll be brief because I'm just going to echo what I, I want to thank Sandy, especially for getting it into the paper and, and rallying the, the troops, so to speak. 
Eric and Barbara said it eloquently. We're playing with fire here, and we're lacking a, a current and updated master plan. And, uh, you know, I recognize double speak, and I, my mind's not blown that this is way too risky to embark upon to basically open it up wide open to development pressures in this economy and with the housing pent up housing demand. So I echo the sentiments to re reject this uh, change and get the underlying planning and, and pre precautionary, you know, New England conservatism in place before you uh, uh, start reducing the density. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, digitally? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, so we are going to move on now to um, the next, the next one. Um, and just so folks know uh, how this is going to proceed, um, we're going to take up the rest of uh, these for public comment, uh, and then we'll have a time for us to to um, comment on them as, as council. But then um, when we do that, I'm gonna ask again that we separate out items three and seven for commenting um, so that I can recuse myself. Uh, and uh, we had scheduled a presentation from the Vermont River Conservancy. I do not think we were gonna get to that tonight. So we've already let them know that um, that has been pushed back uh, in case anyone was waiting for that. Um, Okay, so a number nine, I'm gonna get back to it here. Okay, number number nine, technical fixes. There's a, a number of um, sub items in this. Anyone wish to comment um, in person uh, on the minor technical fixes? Yes. <laughs> In my line of work, I've worked in um, societies in different parts of the world um, and on matters of matters where communities and societies have started to lose respect for the rule of law. And when that happens, the society of the community breaks down and chaos results. We're seeing a little bit of that here, and I would like to urge the council in particular, because I think you people are the, the brain trust that we're not the brain trust that the command central who can enhance respect for the rule of law in Montpelier and its protection, and who can promote coherent government between your planners, between your um, between your density increasers and your historic preservationists, et cetera, et cetera. And when it comes to solar access, that's another issue. Um, I am against uh, the recommendation in the memorandum on solar access, and I am against it because it goes against the Vermont Municipal Regional Planning and Development Act, section 4303, para 24, which defines, and I don't have it in front of me, um, but you can find it, which defines renewable energy, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about solar access here, especially in 2022 with all that we have in front of us, the recent climate plan that Vermont has passed, et cetera. We're talking about, in the case of solar access, we're talking about renewable energy. And if you consult that statute, which Montpelier has to respect, like it or not, that statute says that renewable energy, in the case of, for example, sun, they are referring to conversion, which this um, regulation, this provision is about, or collection. Montpelier has, has two net zero goals for net zero 2030 for the municipality and net zero 2050 for the entire city. The development, the um, uniform def unified development regulations must implement the master plan and certainly cannot adopt, you cannot adopt provisions that fly in the face of the master plan. And the master plan is supportive of the state laws approach 
to energy conversion and collection. If this city wants to reach its net zero 2030 and 2050 goals, if this city is honest and genuine about the ordinance that you pass, the Home Equity Information Ordinance, if you were sincere in passing that ordinance, denying buildings solar access that warms their thermal mass, that provides daylighting, which means people don't need to pay money for electricity or whatever, you will not reduce, you will not go back in time in terms of your regulations on solar exposure and access. You will move forward with the state, respecting state law in the process in an effort to preserve this city and our planet for our children and our grandchildren. The recommendation being made here and I don't mean to insult anyone, I'm just speaking from a legal perspective and an environmental perspective, is nothing short of retrograde. When you move back from seeing solar exposure as a question of those nice little panels, I have them on my roof. But when my company, Sun Common, came in to design that array, they took into account the solar gain that my house received, the passive warming, that it received in the thermal mass, that's the stone, the concrete, et cetera, the daylighting I received through the windows. So when, if Montpelier is sincere and genuine about its various ordinances and the city council's 2018 directive to staff and departments to move towards net zero 2030, you will not walk back in history and further damage our children and grandchildren's future by limiting our capacity to meet those goals. Thank you, anyone else? Hello, Thomas Weiss again. And I am also commenting on solar access. Um, but first of all, I don't consider what's being proposed for solar access to be either minor or a technical correction, or a technical fix, I think is the word that was used. Um, I, I believe it's actually quite major. Um, but restricting access to sunlight is also a master plan issue. It won't comply with the master plan. Uh, the proposal is to restrict access to sunlight for both energy, and it also means that it restricts access to sunlight for growing food. The proposed amendment is contrary to decisions made by the Planning Commission in developing the, uh, I believe it was the 2018 zoning regulations, as I mentioned, it's contrary to the master plan. It's contrary to goals of sustainability and of the Global Warming Solution Act. It's also contrary to the city's goals to become net zero. The two sections that are proposed for being amended now create a right of solar access for growing food and to access to active and passive solar energy systems. And the proposed amendment does not preserve that right. Also, the proposed amendment is limited to solar energy devices. Passive solar features use solar gain on walls and roofs and are not devices. So shading of walls will eliminate solar access for passive features and their ability to heat a structure. Passive solar is actually more sustainable than active solar and needs to be encouraged. The proposed amendment will discourage passive solar. Um, I did my master's degree in solar energy a number of years ago. Passive was just beginning to be analyzed from an engineering basis. Um, and I did my master's thesis on orientation of solar collectors. Everybody else was looking at, oh, what's the best orientation to get the maximum? But I was concerned about the kind of situation we have in Vermont, where we have so much existing housing stock, and we've got to figure out, well, 
if I'm going to put the panels on my roof, which faces southeast, how much am I going to lose against that maximum orientation facing south at just the right uh, angle? So anyway, that's just a little background as, as to my uh, background and knowledge on, on solar energy. And the proposal, as I said, is, is contrary to the master plan. The proposed amendment fails to move the city closer to achieving at least six goals in the master plan. Um, and and I, I have a little table in the written testimony, which you haven't received yet, and which you will receive over the next few days. So I plan to bring it or get it here tomorrow, and I don't know when you'll actually get it. Um, so I, I do have some alternative suggestions for amending section 3206. Uh, the, the first section that's proposed to be amended calls for uh, the city's energy goals and policies strongly encourage solar heating and a number of other things. I suggest that you add growing food be added to the list of strong encouragements for the city's policy. Um, the right of solar access for walls and roofs should be expanded to more than 15 degrees away from true south. My street, including my house, most houses have their sunniest roof facing southeast, which is 45 degrees away from south. And that only gets about a 10% penalty from if my house faced with the same roof orientation or slope uh, faced due south. And a lot of the other, there are a number of other houses on my street, roofs about the same thing, and they also have solar panels. So there's a lot more uh, need to protect solar access even further away from south than the existing ordinance does. Um, also, the existing ordinance talks about the orientation of a yard, but the orientation of a yard for solar purposes depends on where the slope faces, not where on the location of the yard with respect to the structure. So solar access for yards should exist for a yard in any orientation. Uh, and that's on the basis of a yard being used for growing food and not necessarily for energy purposes. So I believe the proposed reduction to solar access is short-sighted. Our goals, our need for sustainability require a longer range vision. We need to keep open our future options for homegrown food and for solar access. And that's one thing that I crossed out in my talking copy here is that the way the amendment is proposed, it precludes future access where there isn't an existing solar device. Uh, so anyway, so please do not adopt the proposed amendment to section 3206. I ask that you consider and adopt my alternative suggestions for that section. And thank you for taking the time to hear me three times tonight on these comments. Thank you. Anyone else in person? <clears throat> Okay, and so not seeing anyone, we'll go to folks with us digitally, uh, Vicki Ann Lane, go ahead. Um, yes, I may be just misunderstanding this or reading more into it than is there, but um, this business of shading, does this mean that neighbors can request that you remove things that shade their property? Um, is this going to cause a... Um, an issue where someone demands that a property owner remove or alter something because it might shade their own, their property. That's my concern, that this could end up being something unpleasant. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Alan Johnson, go ahead. I uh, don't want to repeat some of the uh, points that I've made, but I also had about, um, you know, being more, the shading being about more than existing PV systems. Um, I don't want it to 
I think those are valid. It does seem like this should be pulled out as not just a, a basic technical correction here. Um, and maybe some more, more thought put into it. Uh, Lauren, uh, you did a great job taking the words out of my mouth with your question earlier about, um, you know, what do we do about potential new PV systems? Um, I just had a, maybe a, a thought that, um, I wonder if there's some solution around, uh, the concept of right away there, where if, um, you know, somebody doesn't have an existing system, but a new development is, uh, removing access for, um, uh, expansion later or development of a, a system later, maybe the new development could have a right of way with an, a group net metering solution um, and say, you know, well, we have the right to put solar on your roof if you're going to block our roof or our yard or wherever solar may be sited. Um, you know, it's not a strict right of way thing, but it's a similar concept. Uh, just a thought. And uh, I miss you, Lauren. Good to see you. <laughs> Okay, um, anyone else digitally? Okay, so we are gonna move on to number 10. Um, doing this in order, even though <clears throat> we skipped to uh, 11 in the presentation, uh, river hazard area regulations changes. Anyone in person? No? Okay, anyone online? Okay. Uh, great. So, and on to number 11, uh, adjustment to the riverfront boundary in Sabin's pasture. Anyone in person? Okay. And anyone online? Okay. All right. With that, I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you everybody for your comments and your time and uh, uh, folks' thoughtfulness about uh, your questions and comments. So at this point, um, we can have a sort of a council conversation about what we'd like to do. Uh, I'd request that we, for this part, if you could pull out um, parts three and seven. Um, other, so council thoughts on, on any of this besides those two parts. And if, keep in mind that it's 10.09. <laughs> oh, Jack, go ahead. I have a couple of thoughts. Uh, I, in general, I uh, I strongly support the changes. I think it's uh, <clears throat> it's really, in most cases, it's really getting us in the direction of where we want to go as a city, and uh, achieve the goals that we have. With regard to number eight, I thought it was quite interesting that. Uh, Mike Miller and Kirby Keaton are really not that far apart at all in terms of what they're saying. And even though the uh, the Planning Commission voted out a proposal to adopt this change immediately, Kirby was very clear that we need to have a conversation and we're having a conversation now and this is just the start of the conversation. I think uh, moving to allow more density is, <laughs> is very important and as i was working on uh, advocating for the last amendment to the zoning by law that was one of the main things that i was hoping to see uh, more uh, more density but i think that uh, this needs more work before we're ready to adopt it and so i would not support uh, adopting proposal number eight now and i think we we should have more of a community conversation and having having taking it up there at our next meeting isn't enough of that conversation to make me think that we can uh, go forward that now to that now and so at some point uh, either now or after there's more conversation i'm going to be moving to uh, take that piece of it out of it before we go to the uh, next public hearing um and I, I do think we should have more. The other point that I think is worthy of more discussion is the is the solar access part of it, and I think we need to have more of a conversation about that. I I'm not sure that that can't be resolved by amendment before we, uh, you know, in time to pass it as part of the whole package. But uh, 
I'm less of an expert on this than than other people. Other thoughts? Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, I would concur with what Jack said. Um, I, I think that number eight has a, a lot more work to be done as we've heard from here and as I've had lots of conversations and as this is um, would directly affect my neighborhood. And so I have a very vivid image in my mind when people describe the kinds of things that might happen. And I haven't heard um, a reassurance coming about why I don't have to worry about those things happen. So um, I'm, it may be available, but it needs more discussion and it needs more, more time than I think we can give it here. So I would like to see that pulled out as well. Great. Connor. Yeah, I'll uh, jump on that train as well. Um, but I, I do want to say, you know, there, there were a couple of controversial parts of this. And, you know, I don't want that to take away from the amount of work that was done by, you know, the Planning Commission and Mike here. There, there was a lot of good work here. Um, and I, I actually really appreciate Kirby being a bit provocative. I don't know if that's a word he said uh, to sort of uh, force this discussion because it's a discussion that needs to be had. You know, um, I. I don't mind if Montpelier is not the smallest state capital. We, we need to grow or we're going to die here. It's uh, less than 100 homes are sold every year. The average rents are 1,600. The people who work in this town can't afford to live in this town. And to me, that's unhealthy and it's unsustainable. So we need to take action. And we hit walls when we try to develop in rural areas. And I, I, you know, I'm not saying anybody's coming in with any wicked like motivations here. It's like Bob McCullough said, it's competing values, right? We want to preserve wildlife. We want to preserve green space. Uh, but we get walls when we try to build in these places. The same with like neighborhoods. Is it too dense already? Uh, so we, we have to be thoughtful about it, but we've, we've got to do something here. And I like the idea of not waiting forever to have these conversations. Do it soon. But, you know, let's make sure our ducks are in a row. Uh, we look at like, you know, what regulations are in place to preserve the aesthetic nature of certain neighborhoods. Right now, we see what we need to do on it and have a more uh, c comprehensive discussion on it. So uh, huge thanks to the Planning Commission and everybody who came out tonight. Um, and I, I like the direction Jack is going there. Yep, and I would um, add to that. Um, uh, I, I, Kirby, I hope that you pass along to the Planning Commission our gratitude uh, for their work on this. And uh, I would uh, like us to, I would like to see us go in the direction of eliminating uh, density, but together with uh, some updates or thoughtful, you know, crafting like intentional crafting around uh, how we how we ensure that uh, you know we're not necessarily just getting just big blocks of buildings um, necessarily. Um, so. I do hope that the planning commission comes back to us with uh, with this together with um, some thoughts on the the uh, characteristics of um, of how how we do protect our our neighborhoods. Um, and I see Jennifer Morton. You have your hand up. Go ahead. All right, I'm unmuted, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say that I, you know, I've had a lot of really great conversations in the last week with um, folks about this, about number eight. And I feel like I need a little more time as well um, because most of the people I spoke with all felt in line about things. So I would like to kind of look at the other side before I can make a really good solid decision. So I agree with Connor and uh, Jack about pushing it out a little bit, giving us more time. Thank you. Donna. Well, I also want to pull eight. I'm concerned about solar, and I guess I would direct staff to come back with taking in the consideration of the criticism of that section. But the thing about density, I just want to put a heads up. I've sat through all the sign review district and all the people who wanted to get out of it. And I just, you haven't seen a group yet. When you start saying your house is going to be put in a sign design review zone or district, it, it'll fill the room. 
totally. Uh, and that's a fine. That's fine to do. I'm just saying it's going to take a lot more time than just the issue of density. Uh, and that's good, but it, it definitely needs to be dealt with in a, in a long term basis. And it's true, we're overdue for our master plan. When we did it, we promised we would go back and we, we haven't. So that's always a good reminder. And I thank everybody for nudging us along. I am, I'm surprised because I, I, when I read over the solar, I was bothered by the shade. And I don't know how you deal with that. If it's my tree and person put solar and now my tree has grown, what happens? Um, so I'll be inter interested how you work the language on that one. <laughs> But we, we definitely, I think, need to take out eight and the solar. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm mostly just concurring with um, what other folks are saying. Um, you know, agree. I'm definitely concerned with the current solar um, section. So look forward to uh, Mike working some magic there to come up with something that allows for, um, you know, new solar and not limiting people's access to that. Um, on the density issue, I, I agree. I'm really glad we're having this discussion. I mean, I think it's happening in communities all over the country as people wrestle with, you know, how do you maintain character and feel and grow and allow new people to come in and address the housing crisis. So I'm, you know, also appreciative of the Planning Commission putting forward a provocative idea and getting us talking. And I, I think, I mean, it sounds like I, I don't know enough <laughs> about like the entire process and all of our zoning in and ins and outs. So maybe there's like a middle ground between being in design review and some other um, aspects we could add to the zoning regulations that could do some of that maintaining character or something. So maybe there's some ways to to get at it that don't fully bring people into design review. So I'm um, looking forward to lots of uh, creative discussions about how we can meet our city goal of increased housing, bringing new people in, um, and, you know, really with climate migration and Vermont being on like every list that you see as like the top place to move, I think we're going to see more and more pressure for housing, people moving in. So us really getting ahead and thinking about what kind of community we want to see, I think is going to be increasingly important in the coming years. So this is just a really important discussion. and. Like really grateful to all the thought people have put into it and the really um, incredibly thoughtful comments tonight from folks from the community. I have one further thought, which is um, just want to note something that Sandy said that I thought was really interesting, um, just about when we send out notices to people that go to the landowners. Uh, and so if there are tenants in those buildings, they might not necessarily get those um, notices and that feels like it's worth thinking about and figuring out how do we get notices to tenants um, you know just off the cuff here it seems like um, renters ought to be able to sign up on some list uh, that they could get notice well uh, notices maybe this already exists but um, I, I guess I'm just thinking about like what do we have um, for for renters to be able to access this information which is not necessarily being passed on to them from their landlords um, yeah Donna I just ahead. wondered if we could actually in any way require owners to give it to tenants we can ask I don't know how we would enforce well, maybe let's anyway, the, it, uh, is that something that we can just put on your radar to, to think about? Um, Jack, did you have something to say about that? We, we've got the uh, voter checklist, which isn't obviously, you know, it's not 100% up to date. There's yeah. all kinds of weaknesses with it, but tenants register to vote where they live. Yep. Yep. Mike, did you have something you want to say about that? If not, that's I, going to say, there were, I mean, there were articles in the bridge, there were articles in the weekly report. I mean, I think the, the bigger push is if we could, if there was just a more general outreach to try to get people to sign up to get the weekly report, I don't know if that's something everyone can sign up to get. I mean, these, these are talked about in the weekly report. Yeah. These are talked about in the bridge. These, right. you know, they, they're, they're in a lot of, we're, we're not hiding them. They are there. You have to read those things regularly. Hearing the yeah. issue and then you go looking. I mean, it's inevitable. Well, this yeah. might also be a can topic. Anyway, I just wanted to flag that um, for us because it also feels like an equity issue. So, um, righto. Um, any other, oh, Jack, yes. 
So at this point, I move that we uh, take uh, item proposal eight out of the uh, proposed ordinance amendment. Did you have to close the public meeting? She did. I did. Oh, I, did. Did. I did yeah. close the public meeting. <laughs> so there was a motion there? Mm -hmm. I'll second. Okay, for the discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Uh, okay. Um, do you, like, you switch now? Yeah, I mean, unless people, folks want, I guess we're not, did folks want to take out number, uh, the solar, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Unless you want to just note it and that we're gonna, coming back to it or something. Yeah, go ahead. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> I might. You gotta use, use them, okay. Mike. Um, I would move we remove it. I mean, if staff wants to come back with an alternative proposal, um, but I don't, I'd rather not see it move forward than Okay. Personally, um, it seems like a limited the solar provision. So I'd like to also move to remove that. If if there's a, we could always add something back in next week. Would that be a friendly amendment? Or is <laughs> well, no, we voted already. Oh, we voted so. on that. Voted that. Oh. So second. I don't know. Oh, so you're you're seconding <laughs> taking out the solar part. Other comments on taking out the solar? Yes, Donna. Well, but they're going to come back at the next hearing, and there's changes. I, I'm I guess I'm more look pessimistic. At the changes, and we don't like them. We can take it out at the second <laughs> hearing. Well, there's a motion. You can vote it down. Um, other thoughts? No. Okay. This, this is the time to debate the motion. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> no. No further thoughts on taking it out. Yeah, Carrie. It feels cleaner to me to take it out and we can put it back in after it's amended, but since we took that other one out, so I'd be in favor of that. Okay. So one. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that generally when we go from first to second hearing, we do give staff specific things to edit. So unlike eight, which I see not being dealt with at all in the next few months, I would hope solar could be worked out. So I don't see it as an exception of what we usually do when we have something that's not quite right. So also, I would just add to it, if we take, if we vote to take it out, I, I feel like that is sort of a signal to staff to not work on language because we're not bringing it back up. Does that make sense? If you want them to work on it, we should leave it in. Do you, do you have thoughts on that? Or you just want it out. I'd be fine with it not being worked on, but if it's, if <laughs> okay. we already did. Okay. Well, no. Okay. As long as we're clear on what the the vote is, that's fine. Um, but you're going to have to do roll call because you got one in your mouth. Yes. Well, potentially. We'll see. Well, it could be unanimous. Yes, Who knows? You are. You're going to have to do <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Okay. Well, uh, any further discussion on the solar? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. I seconded it, but I, uh, <laughs> I, I You're voting. It'd be, it's better to leave it in okay, for it to be worked on. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm going to go around in um, person first, then we'll go online. Lauren. Aye. Jack. Nay. Connor. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Donna. Nay. And uh, Jennifer. Uh, yes. Okay. Aye. Sorry. Uh, Four to two, so the um, eyes have it. So we will take that part out. Um, okay. And so now we can switch roles. Jack, um, I'll take off. So now we are to uh, items, proposals number three and number seven, which I think we can, you, you want to discuss them? Let's do, do them separately. Um, what do, what do people think about uh, proposal three, which is the Northfield Street rezoning? Yeah, Donna. Yeah, I support it. I mean, it goes right in this neighborhood. It's not, I support it. Yeah. Is there anybody who doesn't? The, the only question I had um, for Mike, like if you rezone, it has to be the whole parcel. It sounded like part of the concern is there's steep areas that they don't wanna develop. We don't think they're gonna be developed. Like, is there a way to 
you know, keep some of the parcel rural that we really don't want to see development on, but somebody could make a proposal in the future to, but that would allow the habitat project and what, whatever project or is that just untenable? Um, we generally, we have a general rule that we try not to subdivide parcels. That said, we, we have number um, 11 that talks about Sabins being split into two parcels. So it does happen, Crestview is split into two. Um, so it's not impossible to do that. But in general, we try to follow property lines. It becomes a lot easier for just staff for being able to administer things and, and you end up having some less confusions. Um, but I think there are opportunities once we get through his uh, through the development, the feasibility steps of the process, if they end up subdividing the lot into a couple of pieces, then we've got a line that we could go through and and rezone at another time. Um, but it isn't impossible to go through and say, make this part that district, as long as there's a clear line. What we don't want to do is occasionally we'll get these things up. This will follow the 640 foot contour line. And we, we don't want that. If it's if you look on a map and it's like, well, there's already a pin here and there's already a pin here, just draw a line between those two and make that one and make that the other. <laughs> and the thing I, I want to observe about that is that we don't know if Habitat is going to uh, wind up being able to develop this property. What we have from them is the assurance that they're not, if they do, they're not going to build in that place where the neighbors were very concerned about them not building. And it feels like it might be hard to defend if, if we're essentially saying we're going to zone it to let this developer do what they want to do, but if they don't do it, then <laughs> we'll block what the next developer wants to do. I don't know. I, I would keep it the way it is. Everybody okay with that? Move on to number seven. Um, I'm sorry, so you're putting this aside to talk about later? Oh, no, I'm seeing. I'm, I, I'm uh, thinking we're, I'm, if anyone has anything more to say about three, we should do it now. Okay, so closing the discussion, what's the status? It moves forward. It moves forward, okay. We'll eventually have a motion move. to move forward, yeah. Okay. Okay. But I, I, I think what we should do, what I, what I would suggest we do is discuss three and seven, and if everyone's happy with both of them, then yeah. we move to move those forward. I, I understood that part. I just wasn't sure how we, I got confused with your in statement. I was feeling okay. like you wanted to not leave it in. So okay. It's fine. Sorry. I'm clear now. Sorry for the confusion. Um, and item seven was the uh, removal of the requirement to use new neighborhood and conservation PUDs. So any discussion on this item at all? That's sounding like a no, okay. And, uh, and Jennifer, I'm not seeing your face right now. Are you okay too? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> so Michael, you convinced us finally. <laughs> so. Five is, years. Is Five there a. Years. It wore you down. I, I see uh, Vicki Hantley and you have your hand up. Uh, this is council discussion. Do you have a very brief comment? And you're muted. Yes, um, I just wanted to offer a suggestion for getting things into the hands of tenants. Just have the post office drop the letter into every mailbox. Thank in you. the area which you want. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on along. Um, I invite someone to make a motion that we uh, adopt uh, items three and seven and move forward to second reading on those. So moved. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Turn the chair over to the mayor. All right. 
I didn't quite hear your motion. What, what was it? Oh, I know, right? I just killed it. Ex as expected. To move. Advancing three and seven. Four, okay. With Without you uh, right. being, being part of the discussion. Okay, so I think we, uh, what we probably need now here, team, is a uh, motion to set the date for the second public hearing on this, uh, which would be at our next meeting, which... Uh, let me just yes it's already been warned it's already in the been newspaper warned. so okay so we we'll don't actually need a motion <laughs> okay great so we will not do that <laughs> it, yeah zoning zoning follows slightly different rules for new members so because zoning is set in statute for the process for adopting it there isn't a first reading and a second reading under a traditional ordinance change it follows the two required public hearings so okay. which have to get warned in the paper so we usually do that in advance Okay, well, um, with that, then I think we are done with our regular business, which is very exciting. Thank um, you, Michael. <laughs> yes. Thank you. yes, I agree. Thank you. So does yeah, that Jack. mean that I shouldn't have had uh, Donna move that we go forward on three and seven, or should we now m make a motion to go forward on the remaining items that were not amended out? I move that we... Uh, advance the remaining items of the proposal that were not voted out and that means everything but three and seven which are already advanced and eight and solar access which have been amended out i'll second further discussion all in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. and opposed okay great uh all right so um we are up to council reports uh, I'm just going to go around the room. Um, all right, Donna, go ahead. Thank everybody who came out tonight and who's emailed us. I want people to know their email is as strong as when they show up and really appreciate it. And I do want everyone to know that the average length of time talking was six and a half minutes. And I didn't add. Yeah, I mean, so the shortest, I mean, there were like four people under six minutes. So you may not realize that when you're talking, but when we say two minutes, it's just trying to get five. It would be a miracle. <laughs> yeah, I want to apologize for not cutting folks off, but I, did, I wanted to, uh, like... But, you know, and, and talking to anyway. Yeah, well, and, you know, maybe for the next time I'll say, okay, I'm, we're going to recommend two, but we're cutting you off at five. Or whatever, whatever it is, I, I got to be better about <laughs> enforcing that. Thank you, uh, Karen. I, I also would just want to thank everybody that came out and um, all the people who contacted me and emailed me and called me and um, provided me with a really fast, intensive education about some aspects of zoning has been very greatly appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> Connor. All right. Congratulations to the state champion Montpelier High School yeah. basketball team, which uh, won again. That's really exciting. Um, and then I'm looking forward to delivering some meals tomorrow with the senior center at 1120. So I think that invite's still open for other folks there. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. Um, I too wanted to thank everybody that sent emails and I had phone conversations with. Um, this was really a great way to start out um, this next year and I look forward to having further conversations. I apologize for not being there. My son was exposed to COVID so we're all quarantining um, and I wish that I was there with everybody and could see how many people were sitting in there. I, I think that's amazing that so many community members showed up. I really am bummed that I missed it, but um, yeah, thank you all for the engagement and I look forward to our next meeting. Thank you, Jack. The only thing that hasn't been said is that there's been, a, there was a lot of discussion tonight about the uh, master plan and are we just sleeping on the master plan? Are we ignoring the master plan? The answer is no, that work is going on in various city committees about uh, all the component parts of the master plan and the planning commission and the planning director have been working on it for at least a couple of years and uh, they'll be coming forward with uh, with a proposed master plan and bringing it before uh, before the council I, I don't know the timeline kirby's got his hands up he, hand up maybe he knows the timeline if, uh, but but 
but it, it's happening and it's a big project and I think it's going to be uh, good when it's uh, when it's done. Kirby, do you want to add something? Yeah, just to give you the update since that came up a lot. Uh, we're halfway done. We're halfway done with rewriting the city plan from scratch, basically. Uh, it's going to be very different, very new. Um, and uh, we think that definitely by the end of the year, you'll see it probably in the fall. We want to work with a consultant. We're going to have an online master plan for the first time, um, which a lot of that credit goes to Mike for organizing and masterminding, having the online master plan. But big new things, and we've been working very hard on, on the master plan. And some of the big chapters like economic development and housing, um, natural resources, those are all done. So we're, um, so we've making great progress actually. I'd also like to, um, I don't know how, I'd, how to let you know what my email is, but if anyone would like to, um, meet and talk about planning commission things, um, I'm available for that. Um, I heard a couple of the new city councilors mention that they met or they've been in contact with people this week and learned a lot about it. Um, in some ways that made me interested in maybe, also influencing you then, because if you're getting influenced by people who are against us, maybe you should be influenced by this planning commission too. So, <laughs> so I'm totally available to meet and maybe I'll send you all an email and let you know uh, if you want to go for a coffee or something and I'm totally up for that. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Just would echo all that. And only other thing, um, it was brought up in public comments many, many hours ago. Um, but it was just the Elks Club first hearing was fabulous. Uh, seeing 155 people or so show up, like great discussion. Thanks to Paul Costello for facilitating. Um, I just thought like just the energy and ideas, it was really great and a lot of good ideas, both for the property and how to maintain a really inclusive and great process for how we kind of think through that project. So I was just really grateful to the staff for pulling it together quickly and um, everyone for showing up and bringing a lot of great energy to it. So it was really, I think, uh, exciting to see where we go from there. Yeah, um, I agree. That was a great meeting. Uh, I will also be at uh, the Senior Center tomorrow at 1120 uh, to drive for Meals on Wheels. I am excited about that. Uh, and uh, I also am just grateful that uh, folks are turning out for things. I just, you know, taking a step back, I feel like we are having um, an increased level of participation in uh, city conversations. And I think that is wonderful. Um, and while it can always be better, I just want to celebrate that uh, for, for a hot second here. Uh, and with that, I will go to John. Just really quickly, it's not really related to anything we were talking about, but I, I promised Mr. Whitaker I would stand up and be counted at the uh, idea of trying to collect all of the various recordings, video recordings from Orca and trying to host them ourselves. I do have some contact out to uh, Rob at Orca about that, and it would be a mighty, mighty lift, but it would be also a cool thing. So. Cool. Thank you. And Bill. Uh, yeah, I got a few things here. I hope my mic is working. Um, first of all, because it's come up two or three times, the next smallest capital city is Pierre, South Dakota at 14,000 residents. So we've got 6,000 residents to go before we lose our status. <laughs> I, think our, I think we're good. I think, yeah, I think you're probably for right. For a while. Um, <laughs> Secondly, I will follow up, I have followed up. Um, Mr. Whitaker made a, a suggestion that maybe we needed a special meeting. I'm not sure about that, but I did send an outreach to our attorney to find out uh, about his, uh, you know, he claimed, uh, the allegation is that we uh, do not keep proper minutes. And I, I don't know what the city clerk said, but we I know they meet the legal requirement for minutes. And, um, we do have recorded meetings that are available to the public, so I'm not sure how we don't meet the law, but if we have to meet to say that, um, we'll probably set up a Zoom meeting or something uh, if that's required. Um, I was going to also mention the Elks Club Forum, and it did come, so it was, the turnout was great. Um, and like I said, we are collecting, the, we are assembling the, the 
the information, the comments that were made, categorizing it, and now that we will be uh, having our access, you know, the Polco um, public polling system available to us, we will use that to um, set up some electronic two-way communication with the public about this process. Um, I, I just want to also remind, I know the council knows this and anyone that's listening, but this is going to be a long process. I, I think, you know, I, it's great to hear people asking you know, if we've changed zoning and if we've done all these things yet, but that we're, we're just a long way from that. And so we will talk about that more at the next meeting. However, that brings me to the next meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the fact that you changed the zoning may have helped quite a bit um, because we have a lot of, you know, some things from this past meeting got moved to next meeting. So I'm going to try to shuffle the thing. So I'm not going to go through it all now, but so, some of the things you've seen dates, and I know Jack, you'd asked like for the housing task force to come in. We may need to move some of that around just to accommodate everything. But again, I was also worried that we we're going to be another two or three hours on zoning and it may be a lot faster with number eight, number three, or then the sun, the solar thing out. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and lastly, I just wanted to raise um, an issue that we've been getting a lot of calls about, and I'm sure many of you have, which is the, the Girton Park structure on, on Main Street. And uh, as you know, we, we had a lot of uh, issues with it in its prior locations. We moved it here to see how that worked. And, um, you know, I, I probably have to report that it hasn't really worked. And right now it's our number one uh, calls for both police and fire uh, in the entire city, uh, even more so than the Econo Lodge. And we've got, you know, we've got that data. Um, we were getting tons of complaints about people, you know, going by and all that stuff. So I wanted to raise it all with you. I think we as staff would be prepared to take action and move it or take care of it if you all think it you would rather have a public uh, agenda item about that. We can do that at, at the next meeting, but we do, we at least would recommend some pretty urgent action, but it did not want to unilaterally take action without giving you all the chance to weigh in. Any thoughts on that team? Yeah, Lauren. Is there an obvious place to move it? I'm not, I don't know that we would move it, move it, move it. I would, I mean, I think we, we would, it wouldn't be there <laughs> and it might not be anywhere it might be maybe in hubbard park i mean i don't think it it's in, in our minds and i think the public's minds is is no it's not really a public amenity at this point and so i don't know where it would be an effective public amenity but maybe there is a place but it, i'm not sure it would be right in the proximity and I, I would say the homelessness task force know about the idea of possibly moving it back to the river bank there, but I, I think it might be a bit much to move it to another location without engaging the homelessness task force, at least for a meeting there. I, I spoke to Ken Russell today and, uh, you know, he, he floated the idea. It might be a good time to have a public hearing with the homelessness task force uh, just on the issue because a, a, a lot of things have come up just with Garden Park and you know, I, I think it'll continue to be a community conversation. So, I, you know, I'd like to have it on the agenda before it gets moved to, you know, kind of an unknown location. You know, I, I think if it goes back to the riverbed, I, I, I think that's okay for now. But you don't want to move it twice either, right? Well, that's that's fine, and it's not quite ready. To, I mean, I think the ground's still frozen and everything, but we just wanted to be prepared. And I think, given that our next meeting is April thirteenth, if that's if you wanted it on that agenda, we wanted to make sure. We were prepped for that so that it wasn't that meeting and then pushing it off even further. Donna, did you have something? I was just wondering if Bill was wanting it, us to ultimately make a decision about being. So, so what I'm asking is if you all would like to have this as for further public conversation, that's fine. And I get that. And we'd be happy to put that on the next agenda if that's what you prefer. If not, if you, you're fine with just us dealing with it, we'll deal with it. But if probably will be moved at some point soon, and I'm not sure where. If we do want to have a discussion item next meeting, um, we, we could definitely work with Ken to have that sort yeah. of community discussion over Zoom beforehand, right? It's, uh, so we have some information going into it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not against having it on the next meeting. I don't want to make it, I don't want to make it sound like I'm trying to push this, but I don't think it can wait much longer. So thoughts on having it on the next agenda? 
Okay. Seeing some nods. Okay. That's all I've got. Okay. All right. Uh, so with that, uh, we're at the end of the meeting. So um, without objection, I will adjourn at 1047. Phew.